OTB's The Hurling Pod with James Skell and Paul Murphy. People of Galway, we love you! I don't want to leave the people of Waterford down, you know, because they're my life, you know. People of Waterford are my life, you know, and I, 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 love, I, love, I love my county, you know. We love John it's almost like they're afraid to kind of mm. go and hurl and yeah. just let themselves express themselves. They're, it's like as if they're nearly afraid to make a mistake and sometimes you have to make a mistake and just throw off that bit of nervousness and have a go. Yeah, it's pure constipated hurling. Welcome along to episode 14 of the Hurling Pod where we're going to have to apologise for how much has changed. They say a week is a long time in politics but certainly a very short time in hurling with some of the turnarounds that we've seen in the weekend just gone past. We now know the teams who are going through to the knockout stages of the All-Ireland Championship and the composition of the provincial finals in Leinster and in Munster. The great escape completed by Cork. They looked down and out after their first two fixtures, faced two away games which they had to win to qualify, including having to beat their great rivals Tipperary, and they did so in some style. Conor Lahan back to his best form as Cork won against Tipperary by 3.30 to one goal and 24 points. We wondered what Clare's motivation was going to be going into the final round. Well, it was to top the Munster section on scoring difference ahead of Limerick. They defeated the league champions Waterford 3-31 to 2 goals and 22 and it means the league champions Waterford who looked so impressive a few weeks ago that we were all talking up as the second best team in the country have exited the championship in the middle of May. In Leinster Wexford pulling off the great escape on the last day too winning at their rivals Kilkenny by 122 to 1 goal and 18 Kilkenny limping into a Leinster final where they'll play against Galway Galway rounding off their campaign with a 6 point win against Dublin and Matty Kenny's side despite their good results at the start of the championship have also made their exit Wexford go to the preliminary quarter final and Westmeath will be in the top flight of the Hurling League next year and also playing in the Leinster Senior Hurling Championship they opened up for goals in their game against Leash Niall Mitchell scoring two as they won by five goals and 24 points to Leash's one goal and 18 delighted to say to look back on the weekend's hurling and to take stock at the end of the round robin section we've got Paul Murphy and James Gell lads how are you getting on? How's it going lads? Tremendous how are you? Well, James, of course it's tremendous. Galway have done nothing <coughs> wrong in the Leinster round robin. At this stage, Conor Cooney's the second top scorer in Galway history and a pretty comfortable victory against Dublin, 27 points to 21. And everyone is now going to be talking you up as favourites ahead of playing Murphs Kilkenny because of the way Kilkenny have finished the championship. As a Galway man, you must be absolutely thrilled. Yeah, I actually can't get around the fact now I'm going to try and put a swinger that Galway are, are not the favourites, but they are. <laughs> I can't say much. I was hoping for Kilkenny to to beat Wexford and then I can go in under the radar again but uh, look they're moving well they're working fierce hard like I'm very surprised by how their forward unit are putting up so many hits and so many tackles up front which is making the job a little bit easier for the guys back to field so look the conference is high um, injury wise they are they came through relatively unscathed I know Davy Burke has got a bit of a knock but you'd hope that he'll be back in time and uh, they've got a couple of guys back so the squad is strengthening so look at it looks good um, but again like You'd look at the Leinster final and say, Jesus, I, this is my view now that Galway, Galway should win that game. You know, Galway, they say, if I was to put it down on paper, I'm thinking Galway a better team. But those whores belong to Kinney will come, will come up and they'll give it everything again. Like, and it's a very hard game to call, so it's going to be tight regardless. Yeah, let's jump between those two games from last Saturday because, Murphy, we can ask you about Kilkenny. As performances go, because to me, watching the game, look, there was a lot of excitement, particularly with the save from Murphy, with the block from Rec towards the end. Doesn't tell the full story though. Kilkenny, for me, attacking wise, looked very one dimensional. And that was a performance which was way down from what they played against Dublin the week before. What went wrong for Kilkenny before we talk about how good Wexford played? Yeah, look, I just, I, for me, coming away from it, there was, there was two major factors anyway that um, I wouldn't say led to Kilkenny's downfall. I, you know, give full credit to Wexford. They got their matchups right. It was a performance from Wexford that we hadn't seen since um, you know probably the last rounds of the league like really since the Waterford match when they really fell flat we hadn't seen a really tigerish performance from them and we, we got that on, on Saturday evening but for Kilkenny uh, two things I suppose the team selection for me anyway and I know a lot of Kilkenny supporters even in the stand were a little bit confused with particularly with Parik Welch not starting coming on three minutes to go and then the other side of it was just the setup. Um, you know they, they, they Wexford's plan, which, you know, Wexford were dropping back to you, Keith was dropping back, and the long ball just kept coming, kept coming, and, you know, you're landing down on top of Potty, Foley, Liam Ryan, these lads, and Dio Keith will run all day, so Kenny kept lumping that ball down, um, and then when you when you add into that that 
Park Welsh from he not starting one of Kilkenny's best ball winners the biggest problem is where do you play Park Welsh centre back centre forward midfield that for me is the biggest problem where you play him not do you play him you do play him so the fact that they were landing the ball down and the likes of Park Welsh wasn't there to win it they played far too one dimensional though they, were, they weren't carrying the ball far enough off the pitch um, and they didn't really address that from the sideline in terms of getting the structure back in where Kilkenny would sit back a little bit more and work the ball up as far as midfield and start attacking from there. Even the likes of Adrian Mullen was too far from goal for me. Like, you know, Adrian Mullen's one of the best forwards in the country, really dynamic player. Get him up into the half forward line, full forward line direction. And it, yeah, okay, let him drift out, win the ball, and go attack at Wexford. But in general, those were the two things for me. Just Kilkenny's team selection. And again, like I said, can't say it enough, Porrick Welch not starting for me was a huge thing. And I know a lot of Kilkenny supporters around me when the team was named, because it was only mentioned uh, the two changes, which was Walter Welch was starting instead of John Donnelly and uh, Porrick Welch. When that announcement was made in Owen Park, the confusion that how is this happening that he isn't starting. And then not to even give him a chance really to get a, go- get a foothold in the game. Three minutes to go in the game. There's no player can do anything with three minutes really in a game. Um, but then Kilkenny's one dimensional play that's what really happened but look g- give full credit to Wexford as well they were really good um, and even like some Mikey Dwyer coming on there like he got a great score and it just I think it just typified what Wexford were about they were playing with hunger they were playing with freedom a bit of abandonment and that's something we haven't seen from Wexford in quite a while so like look there's no team who's going to fancy playing them now going into the qualifiers because now they're suddenly back to where we saw <coughs> them in the league and they're a really dangerous team at the moment Mm-hmm. Yeah, before um, we come in on uh, where Wexford was so good, just on the Park Wells decision not to bring him in, that's something I couldn't understand because Kilkenny didn't function that well in the first half. Brian Cody makes no changes. And most of the second half, you're thinking, unless Park Welsh is injured here, surely he's going to be introduced at some point. Kilkenny have to do something different. And then, as you mentioned, it got to 65 minutes, he's still sitting on the bench. That is difficult to understand. Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult to understand. And look, we've seen things like this as well. Last year in the semi-final against Cork, you know, it was a game, like different games called for different players. Um, and in the Cork match, people, I know people around were saying, this is made for Richie Hogan to come in full forward. The ball isn't sticking in there. Robert Downey's having a great game. Get Richie Hogan in. And they brought him on in extra time. Like he was warming up on the sideline. Then Kilkenny got a little bit of a purple patch in the second half. And they kind of said, well, hang on here. Let's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But, you know, still, you needed a ball winner in there in the form of Richie Hogan. And the, the decision just came too late for me in, in that match, obviously enough. But then, similar enough with this on Wexford, with, with Wexford on Saturday night, you know, Park Welch was the obvious choice to come in. Now, they did make changes. Um, in fairness, Billy Ryan came on and James Marr came on. But Park Welch brings something that a lot of players don't bring. Like, if he roams around, he might just, let's say, drag the centre back out of that position because he has to follow him. You have to follow Park Welch. But also, if you are hitting that high ball down, we've seen Park Welch's fielding is incredible. He'll grab it and make it stick. But the other thing was happening. It was Wexford were grabbing it and making it stick and coming out with that breaking ball. So, if you're going to bring him on, and again, if, if you are bringing him on, he's not injured. So, the idea is you bring him on three minutes to go. That's not an injured player. You bring him on maybe even 10 minutes into the second half. But for me, he has to start. If Park Welch isn't in the starting 15 for Kilkenny, Kilkenny's strongest 15 isn't on the pitch. Yeah, I'd say, Derry, you can couldn't believe his luck that Dio Keith was able to just sweep around in front of the half back line and so much ball found its way to him. Scale, the only thing is, this is a remarkable turnaround from Wexford from where they were the week before because we wondered how much of a blow it was going to be coming off the pitch against <coughs> Westmead, having dropped a point that made it so difficult for them to qualify in the last mm-hmm. round of games where they needed to win. They also needed Dublin to slip up at Tall Hill to qualify. They put themselves in a difficult position and then you get a response from them and that was one of their performances that was probably up there with earlier on in the league when they beat Limerick going back maybe to championship in 2019 they really turned it around very well in a seven day period like they were extremely impressive and I have to like one would think that after the uh, I suppose the negative surrounding the, the, the West Mead result the team could have gone one of two ways either A they'd sink and just they'd, they'd fall to other championship or B they'd rally together have a chat and you know, go at this thing hard, and that's exactly what they did. And I thought, you know, after the first few minutes, that Kilkenny, you know, Kilkenny had were one four two points, and I was thinking, geez, this, this could, this could be, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a score up here. But they battled back, and they battled and battled. And now, in fairness, I have to say, Wexford were very good, but Kilkenny didn't help themselves at all. Like they were so, I was very surprised by how how one dimensional they were. Like there's a guy there on Twitter, like you probably see him tagging you. It's the GA performance process. This guy or girl, I don't know who it is, but it's anonymous. But, but they keep putting up these graphs and information from the games and like and it's excellent and they've tagged us on there about you know, Dio O'Keefe and Richie Reid's distribution and like Richie Reid had the ball 17 times do you know what I mean and every one of them was when you look at it was a pass of like 60-70 yards you know not every one of them but look at 
the, the majority of them. So it was extremely one dimensional. And then when you're chasing a game, and you can see it on, on on the television, obviously, and probably the same more from person is every time the Kenny backs got a ball, it was thumped down, thumped down, thumped down, and it just became monotonous. And it became Wexford just got to grips with it, got to grips with it early, and then just kept trudging along. So very disappointing from Kenny perspective. A lot of learnings from, from you know for them from a from a tactical perspective. But Wexford have got they've got they've kickstarted their, their year again now. So like they're going to be playing. Is it uh, let's let's say Antrim theoretically Antrim defeat Kerry. They'll probably then Wexford will be playing Kerry, Kerry, away Kerry yeah. Home, and and Antrim have the would Munster finalists in the quarter final afterwards. Yeah, so then Antrim will play Cork and then Wexford will probably again th- I'm afraid to say clear in case we get lambasted here, but let's say theoretically again. <laughs> let's say they so they'd have a game against Kerry and then throughout the Munster Munster finalists. So they've got a tough run coming up, you know. So but this this result is, is exactly what they need to kickstart their year, so credit to them. Uh, we'll talk about Lee Chin probably in his performance in a few moments but when I think about it Murph about the style of hurling that Kilkenny were adopting and it was very much a case of almost bypass midfield and try and get the ball up quickly to the forwards which worked really well against Dublin but didn't work this time around you watch the under 20s playing in the final against Limerick at Temple Stadium yesterday they worked the ball through the lines and there were different times during the league when it seemed that Kilkenny were adding a bit of variety to their style of play when it wasn't working on Saturday how come they kept going long? Yeah, um, it's a difficult one to put your finger on um, as to why they kept going long because they've shown um, that that they are hurling with a with, with a style of going short when they need to do it, and particularly during the league. And it's something that I think Kilkenny supporters have understood over the last few years that it's not something you turn on overnight. You kind of have to work it through different campaigns, and like they're in a place at the moment where it's really working now against Dublin. You know, yeah, they were working the ball. Um, relatively short I suppose the kind of medium length passes like you know as opposed to these longer ones we saw on, on Saturday night but at the same time they were hitting long ball and I think the difference against Dublin was that Kilkenny just had more ball winners up there but Wexford were able to compete 50-50 with Kilkenny in those ball winners when the ball is going long probably actually better than Kilkenny really because it was evident that they came out with so many ball so the thing was was that you know again I think it's more of a thing coming from the sideline like it's a tactical change it's not a personnel change so it has to come from the sideline the management to get that message in that listen lads work the ball out sit it back it, it, the players have to implement it on the pitch but we, we've kind of seen this before even when I've been involved with Kilkenny if you go back to 2020 and this is one kind of thing I'm looking at coming into the Leinster final Galway now, let's say compared to 2020 when we bet them in the Leinster final during COVID, um, Galway now sit back further. They don't sit up as, as high as they did in that 2020 final. They brought on Richie Hogan in that final and we all know the goal he scored because the ball came in over. There was no one sitting back. He was able to get the flick um, and he was able to compete with Dahi Burke one-on-one. And then you, co- you go fa- fast forward to the next match where they played Waterford and they tried to, Kilkenny tried to implement the same structure against Waterford which just doesn't work. So my, my thing would be in this game with against Dublin, what, what they did worked against Dublin, but it didn't work against Wexford. Your hope would be that they don't bring this forward now into Galway because Galway will sit back and we saw it against Dublin. They are sitting back in that deeper role as opposed to the traditional Galway of going 15 and 15 and playing up to the lines. They are sitting back that little bit further. So if Kilkenny go with this long ball now, uh, as opposed to working it through the lines, I think <clears throat> Galway could eat them up in the final if they don't rectify it. But like I was saying, for me, that's coming from the sideline. The sideline have to get it into the players to say, listen, we can have any... Can Kenny have 20 players there, 25 players they can use in a game in terms of any sort of re- restructure, move players around. But it's it's a tactical plan that you have to have in place and the players have to know it because you can't communicate that on the pitch uh, in real time. You have to be ready for it before the game to say, listen, lads, we're going to play one of two ways here. Yeah, we're going to use long ball, but predominantly we're going to play the ball through the lines. So for me, it's something that... You know, the Kilkenny kind of management need to really sit down and go put it to the players that listen, lads, if we do this ball against Galway in the Leinster final, Galway will eat it up. Your Dahi Burks, your Garold McInerney's, they'll eat it up. So we, that's the one thing I'll be looking at coming into the final. Not a case of personnel or who's on the pitch. It's more so this game of working the ball through the lines and, and hold back on the long ball. Yes, there's a place for it, but don't, you know, don't hang everything on this long ball. Mm. James, we spoke with Lee Chin quite a bit. We knew he was going to come back in at some point once he was fit. He put his hamstring issues behind him. I think he had a bit of a knock from last week and a dead leg coming out of the Westmead game. Still able to start in midfield, mm-hmm. took over the responsibility of the freeze and he put in a huge performance around the middle of the park. We debated whether he still had the legs for midfield, whether he should be in the half-forward line. To me, the evidence of last week, Lee Chin around the midfield makes Wexford a better team. 
they do like again if you're if, you know, taking on big teams you need your big players in the ball and give big performances like you're expecting for Wexford to be successful uh, they need Lee, Lee Chin to be the top performer that's just that's the be all in all so you, you think back to when was Wexford's most successful year to date probably 2019 when they got to the semi-final and should have qualified to a final and he was their standout player and again he was a standout player of Lord Nolan Park again contributed to nine scores I say I know seven frees but still he was on the ball an awful lot but I like everyone would look at the score sheet and they'd say that, that's a stat for me and that's, that's the easy thing to look at but it's just his work off the ball the actual tackles he puts in and he, he, he's like he's built he's he's a fine specimen I'll put it that way yeah he's a fine looking man <laughs> do you know what I mean he's built like a brick shit house but like uh, and he throws his body around and he just gets in he's a good tackler like it's, it's grand being big and, and being effective uh, you know with size but if you're effective with size and can mix that with being a technically good tackler you know it's excellence which is what he is and he, now he's got confidence so He's a uh, he's a dangerous prospect for opposition teams going forward, and again he's going to be vital to Wexford's Wexford's uh, Wexford's cause. But I think you need to look around the pitch as well, Will. And are they getting enough? I'm just thinking now for Wexford to go forward and for, to challenge the Clares and the Limericks and so on. And that's side of the draw. Are they getting enough out of the forward unit? And I don't think they are at the minute. Like they had, they did have 12 scorers. Don't get me wrong, Kenny, but they only got 115 from play, which is not a, a mass amount of. Of, of shots from play or scores from play when you consider what the likes of Limerick's Clare's Corks are putting up so they need to get more out of Rory like who, who's, his radar was off a small bit uh, but still he takes an awful lot of mind and get to get more out of Conor McDonald and he needs to put the ball lower if he's going for goals you could say and try get uh, try get multiple scores with those guys like you need you need Lee Chin Conor McDonald Rory O'Connor to be contributing in the region of like 1 16, 117, 117 around that mark you need Lee Chin to be getting 8 or 9 you need Rory to be getting 4 or 5 from play and you need, you need Conor Max to be getting one, two, one, three, something, something other sort of the one to challenge to go forward. Yeah, well, Murph, I'm going to give you a shout on the saves and the blocks because <coughs> yesterday Scal was saying to me in the radio one of the best saves he's ever seen for Murphy. The fact that he had to readjust the power that was on the shot, how close Conor McDonald yeah. was to goal, the fact he had to switch his hand over to actually make the save is just absolutely remarkable. We won't probably won't see too many better saves this summer. We're talking about the Nash save back at the start of the championship down in Porky Cueve too. But this one for reflexes was absolutely out of this world. Yeah, it was incredible. And like even when you see it in slow motion, it, it was better again. Um, I know I have a bit of bias there, like, but I, I genuinely think never mind the season, like it's that's one of the best saves you'll ever see. And because just everything was perfect about it. Okay, Conor McDonald could have hit it at a better height, but when you're so close to a keeper at that stage, if that ball hit the back of the net without hitting Owen Murphy, you'd have no arguments. He was so close to him. <laughs> but if you look at the slow motion of it, Owen Murphy stood and stood and stood. He didn't go and chance right, Conor McDonald's hitting this, I'm just going to spread myself. He stood and watched it. And when you see the slow motion, he's looking in the vicinity where the ball went. Like he kept his eyes open to see, right, where is this going to go? Didn't close eyes, didn't just spread himself and actually put the boss of the hurl onto it. Like again, if he got an arm to it or he got a chest or something to it, happy days, you take anything. But he, deli- he stood and just got the hurl to it kept it out by inches. I was I was down on the twenty one um in the new stand and I had a fair good line of it now. And like he was so he was so far back on the line that when he stopped it he actually fell back into the net and the ball just went straight out across the across the goal mouth and he and he got it away. But like it was just a remarkable save. There was no there was no accident about it. He gave himself the best chance he possibly could. And you know, very few goalkeepers, and we, we've seen great goalkeepers over the years that are able to pull, pull off these great saves. But the crowd, get a reaction out of the crowd. Um, you know, it was it was theatrical. But we, we actually, you know, we saw it over the weekend as well. Sean O'Brien and Watford pulled off a few great saves as well, in fairness to him. There was lots of good displays. The Limerick under-21 goalkeeper, he pulled off two really good saves as well in that game. Um, so we, we have seen good displays of keepers, but in fairness to Owen Murphy, like that save, it, it, you know, like when we do a highlight reel at the end of this year, like that'll be right up there in terms of the individual pieces of skill that we see in Hurling. Like it was, it was just an incredible save. So defending skill then, Murph. Damien Reck, at the end of the game, he's to stick his hurl out very bravely to make a block, but then to actually have the wherewithal after making the block to be able to roll lift it because he knew any foul on the ball it's going to give a dead ball opportunity against him that Kilkenny potentially could score uh, particularly with the quality of free takers they have in the team he actually managed not just to make the block but also to successfully clear the ball away too yeah it was it was brilliant defended in fairness and even Matthew O'Hanlon made a great save before because I think it was um, Mossy Keown blocked the ball and he pulled and was going back in fairness to Matthew O'Hanlon something that should be always saying to players that don't give up on it. like Because at that stage, Matthew Hanlon just ran back to the goal, not knowing what was going to happen. Because at this stage, Fanning was coming out with the ball and he was going clear. But Matthew Hanlon made a run back towards the goal 
people just in case. And that's something you'd be often trying to encourage defenders to do is just in case something happens, you're there to cover. Um, Mossy Keown pulls on it back. Matthew O'Hanlon, in fairness, we're, we're all looking at Damien Reck. Matthew O'Hanlon got a great save on the line because that ball was going in. But Damien Reck, to first of all make the block from TJ, he had one chance to rise it. And now the funny thing about it is if Kilkenny forward ran in and flicked it into the net, Damien Reck would have people on his back saying, why was he trying to rise it inside in the yeah. square and pulling it to get it out? Look, he had a half a second, not even a half a second to think about it. He got the block, he saw the ball, he rose it. And in fairness to him, once he had it in the hand, he was making, giving himself the best chance, get out towards the sideline. If anyone hits him there, it's most likely going to be a free out. And he got the free out. But, you know, a remarkable piece of defending out of him and a really important moment in the match because... It, it, it could have been something that people we could be sitting here today and people saying typical Kilkenny you know they got their break just at the end and got their goal and oftentimes we have got that break but defending like what Matthew O'Hanlon did and what Damien Reck did those are when the breaks go your way and it only comes through gambling that you know you're going to be needed in that position and then having the, the bit of the, I suppose the coolness of the brain there just to go yeah rise it just go about it as if I'm rising out of midfield and there's no pressure on and just get out, get away from goal. So, brilliant piece. And look, we could be, only for that, we could be talking very differently here today about maybe Kilkenny win. So, um, very important piece of defending from Damien Reich. Yeah, James, it's difficult to actually pick out extra players like who play badly. Everyone had a pretty good game uh, at the weekend. One wonders as well whether maybe the mentality issue they used to have against Kilkenny is now out the window because a lot of these guys were around in the period 2017 to now. They've registered a few wins in championship against Kilkenny along the way. Maybe it's not a fear factor going to Nolan Park anymore, which it may previously have been. But just on Rex's performance, he did extremely well in Owen Cody, who's been Kilkenny's danger man. And going into that game, the feeling would have been that Cody was probably going to lead their attacking threat. Wreck did a really good job on him. Yeah, like I think if you're, again, if you're looking at, uh, I'm, I'm tempted now to name a top five, but if you're putting you know, the most dangerous forwards in form, like Owen Cody's up there. Like I, I got to see him live uh, against Galway and like I was extremely impressed with him. And I didn't realise that the man is actually as big in person as he is you know that, that as, as he actually is I thought he was actually smaller and slimmer so he's a powerful man mixed with skill so for Damien Rex to do the job he didn't him like that's that goes a long way for putting Wexford in a position to, to win the game so credit to him but he's been doing that like himself and Dunne who will be honest if you even go back to the league game when they play Galway uh, like they're, they're playing fierce well like they have form it's not, it's not as if they're dipping in form every now and then they're, they've maintained you know uh, they've been extremely consistent. Players around them have been dipping in form, in fairness. But those those couple of guys, especially in the backs, have been contributing very positively for Wexford all year. So I can't just say, like, for, you know, for the last week week or two, all year. And again, like, I, I know I repeat myself here, but if, when they're going forward, and like when when they come across a Clare or Limerick, they're going to need Rick to, to marshal, you know, a Galan or marshal possibly a Tony Kelly, because allegedly he's a really good athlete, Rick, so maybe he can keep up the likes of Tony Kelly. So... It's gonna. It's it's good to have a defender who's in such top form and perform like one of the best defenders in the country. So, uh, like, Wexford will come away with an awful lot of the, their stock has risen, obviously, but they're quite content with, with, with the way the way they're performing. And I suppose, then they have a week's break and they have a game coming up against again, presumably Kerry. I'd have to say so. They're going to roll into the next next couple of rounds with uh, with good form behind them and some some sort of rest. So they're good, looking good. Right, well, you've just given me an idea, so I've taken the notepad out here about picking the five most dangerous forwards oh, in the game. Currently. This, look at, look at, this is what happened the last time, right? I named five forwards, right? And to be honest, I forgot Tony Kelly, right? Okay, <laughs> and the whole country is on, is up my arse. Do you know? And I, I was when I was in Innes yesterday. Every I could see clear people looking at me. That's the clown that forgot Tony Kelly. I didn't put Tony Kelly in the top five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So sorry, lads. So go on, keep going with your question, but ask Murphy first. Don't ask me no, first. No, that's, that's fine. So I'm going to do. <laughs> I, I can I can ask Murphy now about the Kilkenny under twenties because we'll kind of put Grinch. Kilkenny into one section here, and you can have a think about the five. And what I'll do is I'll scribble them down, and then we can all pick one by the end of it. If that's so, it. so, what are we picking? The five best forwards. Well, you set the agenda, didn't you, by saying you wanted to pick your... I think you called them the five most dangerous if we were to scrub back in the recording. But we'll go, we'll go in form, I suppose, being yeah. current about. Five, in form, because it could... If you say best forwards at the moment, or transfer list or anything, we'll Someone go down go, a different road. So, in where's, form. Where's TJ Reid? Where's Patrick Horgan? You'll get absolutely <laughs> murdered for leaving one of them out. So I, yeah. feel like, I feel like I'm on an episode of Countdown now. <laughs> Put on the music there in the background. Put on the music, please. <laughs> Depending on how long the answer takes on how well the Kilkenny 20s played, that'll give you long enough to pick your five in-form forwards then, if we're going to call it that. Well, I have three already. Oh, that's all right. Well, then have a, have a tease over the last two and have a think. So, more than a decade went by, Murph, without an under-20 or under-21 title with the age grade changing. 
Uh, that is no change with Kilkenny getting their hands back in the title yesterday in their game against Limerick at Semple Stadium. A little bit of controversy, though, the, the point that wasn't. Now, there were two points that were disputed. And Kilkenny had won in the first half that looked like it was over, but it was wave wide. And then there was the one that Kilkenny were given, but it didn't go to Hawkeye because it looked like maybe it was batted off the bar as opposed to going over it. So plenty of controversy coming out of this. Yeah, plenty of controversy coming out of it. Um, it, it was something, I suppose, it came during the match for, for the Kilkenny point, let's say, that was just, let's say, on the crossbar or whatever it was. There were, they didn't spend a whole lot of time on it on, on TG Cahard, actually. So it was kind of more after the game and the dust was settling that they were debating whether it was a point or wasn't a point. Um, but I think it was f- fair enough to say now at this stage that it probably wasn't. But like you said, there was other decisions in the game that um, Kilkenny had a, a point that wasn't in the first half as well. But look, Hawkeye was available as well in, in Turles. So, you know, maybe avail of it in those situations and not not have the debate. Again, with the hurl being over the crossbar, I'm not really sure of how exactly Hawkeye works with the fact that the hurl has bro- broken the crossbar. Would that actually set off Hawkeye as well? So I don't know. But um, yeah, there was a few, a few contentious points. But in fairness, the Limerick manager came out afterwards and he just said, look, Sometimes that's the way the games go. You know, you know, we did everything we could, and and the breaks didn't just go our way. So um, look, it, it was what it was. But it, look, I, I really enjoyed the game. It was a great game. I saw a few people afterwards saying maybe it wasn't a classic in terms of you know scoring and free flow and and and, and goals and different things. But I just thought the tackling between both sides is absolutely immense. The hooking and blocking was huge, and it was a tough conditions because um, you know it was a very wet day. Um, there was a bit of rain falling. Players were slipping and sliding, but. You know the condition of all the players on both sides was just exemplary. You know, like they're they're just getting bigger each year. These under twenties or under twenty ones. Um, but it was a huge lift for Kilkenny to actually get that. Like I was on the last team that that won an under twenty one as it was then All Ireland, and you know it's a big lift for Kilkenny to get an under twenty um, All Ireland as well because they weren't fancied at the start of this year to go through. You know, played against a good Galway team, went down to Wexford as well. But I suppose the one thing that we'll take away from it after as well is. You know the absence of the under twenty players that are playing senior, Cahill O'Neills and things. You know, it, it. I think it's a real shame not to have these players because when we go back as far as uh, two thousand eight, when we were playing and, and we played Tipperary in the final, we played Galway in the semi final. You know, and Joe Canning was on the pitch and Richie Hogan was on the pitch when we played Tipperary in the final. Like Tipperary would have been completely depleted that day because they would have been without Bonner Maher, Parik Maher, Brendan uh, Brendan Maher, all these ads, Jamie Callanan. So. You know, it, it, it's a shame that we didn't see the likes of Cahill O'Neill and these players on the pitch yesterday. But um, it was a great performance, a really good game, and really tense game right up to the end. Um, you know, right up to Colin Coughlin getting getting the ball at the end, unfortunately hitting it wide. Tough, tough on him. But look, there was other wides hitting the game, and they're as important as his one. So brilliant game in fairness I thought from a tackling point of view from just fighting for every single ball absolutely brilliant and then the few highlights in as well the likes of Billy Drennan from Kenny he was remarkable I think it was 8 points or 9 points he got Timmy Clifford as well had, had a brilliant game at centre forward um, so it, it's a great great win and certainly for Kilkenny people you know all around Kilkenny today anyone is bumping into they were just talking about it, how brilliant it was great win as well so look it's it, it's just for, it's it, it's it's brilliant for Kilkenny to get an underage All-Ireland back into the back on the list Murphy is your man Drennan on the senior squad? Not that I know of no but again he could be on the training panel um, but I haven't heard if he is in there at the moment. But look again, he could be making up training numbers. If not, yeah, I'd be looking at him now that he's he's, he's a, a fair operator. Yeah. yeah, he's great. The scores he got as well. Like I mean, literally, we're talking about Kilkenny against Wexford, and the ball's breaking, and the Wexford lads were getting onto him. You know, he got one or two scores. Literally, the ball broke down. He had it into the hand and snapped over the bar. He got another point from the forty-five where there was one or two Limerick lads near him but he had the presence of mind just to stay calm and he just steadied up and put the ball over the bar where another fellow would have thought he was about to get blocked down but he had great ability to create space for himself and calmness to take the score so yeah look there was a lot of good, really good strong individual performances and similarly like we're talking about Wexford very hard at, you couldn't actually pick out a Kilkenny player that had an average performance they all hurled really really well yeah I'm not to buy you scale too much more time but on the rule Oh. I think they need to have a look at this now because I was thinking about yesterday where O'Neill has been so good for Limerick this year but it's Limerick's off week he will have been sitting I'm not sure in the ground or at home watching a team he could have been involved with on a bye week where he's not involved with the senior panel mm. I think the rule was always intended to be good and that was to try and get guys playing at their age grade and playing for the under 20 before going senior but there were so many players and we spoke about it earlier this year I think on the first round of championship around a dozen got locked out of playing under 20 because they came on for some game time it's terrible pity that they can't play a bit of both 
Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it is a pity, and that that's 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 exactly what it is. You know, like the likes of Carl O'Neill could go on and win an All Ireland with Limerick this year senior, but it still doesn't take away that he could have played and um, potentially won an All Ireland with with the Limerick under twenties. Because for those of us who are lucky to to, to have won, let's say an under twenty one and a senior, like I don't take for granted the days I was hurling under twenty one. They don't mean any less to me than winning my senior All Ireland. Um, like it's 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 something you want to do. You you have a very it's a, it's like a snapshot in time of the group of lads that you were the same age as in your county. Mm-hmm. You travel together. You're on this journey, and you could go win all Ireland. And I'm still meeting lads from 2008, 2009, 2010 when I was playing under 21. And you still meet them, and you have this great connection with lads, regardless if they went to Australia or wherever they went, because you forged this really good friendship during those times. And it comes through being on the pitch and being in trainings and whatever it was. Like we won in 2008, but we lost 2009, 2010. And but we have really good, uh, I suppose, relationships with all them lads. And it's something that we're taking these players away from now. Like you know, the, the players are nearly being punished for being, you know, above the pecking order in their own mm-hmm. in their own age groups so it's just a pity because Carl O'Neill and I'll use him as the example is competing at a really high level with Limerick putting his name on the team sheet for the Limerick senior hurling team at the moment is a savage achievement but if we saw him within his own age group like we'd really see what he's capable of at the moment and I think he deserves that time to to cross over between both because He's not a big fish in a small pond in the Limerick Senior Hurling Panel, but he certainly would show the difference between himself and a lot of players if he was within his own age group in under 20. So for me going forward, I think a lot of people feel the same, that it's just, I think we're losing out a little bit by not having these players involved. Yeah, their teammates are out as well, because if you've got one or two who are of senior standard, they're not available to play. It rips away from the strength of your team as well. Right, let's pick these five informed players then, Scal. We know that uh, Owen Cody's won them, unless he's got bumped in the last three minutes or so. <laughs> no, he hasn't. He hasn't got bumped, right? So, inform. Okay, I'll give you the breakdown first. I have two clear, one Galway, one Kikini, one Limerick. So, okay. from clear, I have Tony Kelly and Shane O'Donnell. Shane O'Donnell has just been sick the last few weeks. He's been unreal. Like yesterday, he was so impressive to watch in the flesh. Um, and like he, he, he turned the sixpence and like he just creates this hysteria among the clear crowd when he gets the ball because something's going to happen. So he's just brilliant. Um, Owen Cody. Yep. I have to stick with him. <laughs> I have Aaron Galan and Conor Whelan. Uh, no, I have <laughs> I have eight honourable mentions. Ah, no, 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 no. You're not allowed to give me No, you can't. You're covering yourself now. So what? Can I give you one. No, no, no. What were the five? Give us the five again. So Tony Kelly, Conor Whelan, Aaron Gillan, Owen Cody, Shane Donnan. They're my five. Go on, Murph. Who's missing? Conor Lehan. He's my honourable mention. You prick. For <laughs> <laughs> God's sake, you, you, you He's have. Top. Conor Lehan is top Melissa. <laughs> Scal, basically what you were doing now is you picked the top five and then anybody eligible for a GPA grant right. is also then in that mix. All right, take it out. So who's coming out so the list? Uh, I'm going to take, uh, unfortunately tomorrow, I'm just going to take out Shane O'Donnell at the moment. Ah, um, no. There's no way Shane O'Donnell's coming out. Shane O'Donnell's been in <laughs> yeah, he year had... form. Yeah, okay. He's, yeah, he's no, been no, good, no, like, but... No, where... you take him out. Let the Clare jury come after you now after Scal's attacking Ennis. So I have Tony Kelly in there, so I've... I've, I've... <laughs> I so do I, so do I. Pe- <laughs> <laughs> I'm appealing to that demographic. No, Shane Donald has been excellent. I just, I nearly feel just because Conor Lee Han hasn't been mentioned here, I can't not mention him. Like, is in he, uh, maybe, maybe I'm getting a little bit too roped up in the fact that Conor Lee Han has been absent from the whole, from the setup and all, and he comes back in. He's been Cork's the best club player in Cork, you know, last year. He comes back in 16 points in three games. And never mind that, you know, in Wa- I was down in Waterford the day, um, Waterford and Cork. He scored five points that day, three from play. And like he's just putting in this big shift. And no more. Shane O'Donnell, absolutely. He's been incredible. I find it hard to take him out. If the, if that's not the case, I'd have to take out someone like Aaron Gillan, another hurler of the year candidate. Connor Whelan. <laughs> Connor Whelan. Like, do you know what I mean? I have to so you just said you just said this, right? I have to take out Aaron Gillan, no, another hurler of the year candidate. I'd I, I <laughs> what you I'm said saying. That. What I'm saying is I'd have to take out okay, I'd take out Connor Whelan then. Connor Whelan I, have to be the example. That's it. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you take out then? This is the thing. Conor and Whelan, I, he, he took Owen O'Donnell for five points this, the other day. Fair enough. Jesus. That's, that's that's right. I, have a, I have a minute. You just keep arguing with me that I have to take out Conor Lehan. I'm not taking out Conor Lehan. I'm leaving him in it. That'll do. Owen That'll Cody, do. Tony Kelly, Conor Lehan, Aaron Gillan, and Conor Whelan. That's my five at the moment. So are we accepting that Lehan is the next best based on what we've seen? It's not just recency bias of 
the damage he did yesterday. We think Lahan based on championship. Do you know what the funny part is? If we were having this conversation four weeks ago, there's no none of us would have left out Stephen Bennett. No, no, that's the thing. Like literally, ago, yeah. If you yeah. if you went four weeks ago, if you went as far as uh, half one uh, Sunday before last. Like this would be a different list. Like Stephen Bennett would be in it. it I, like it's just remarkable what's happened in seven days alone and the whole landscape of the Munster hurling. Like it's just incredible. Like I wouldn't have Connor Lee Hannon there over the. But the two performances he's put in, in fairness, okay, Tipperary didn't put up, and I know we'll get to that. Didn't put up a huge performance, but they needed someone. And the likes of Shami Harandy and these lads stood up in fairness, but. Like Conor Lehan, he hasn't come from an easy place to get back into that team and perform. And I completely take it. Shane O'Donnell has been absolutely brilliant for, for, for Clare as well. How do you pick? But you have to pick five and you just have to go with it. So not simple. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the rat of the Clare crowd now after this. You surely are. You better. I'll put Brian Lowe in there if they want. That that might. <laughs> <laughs> he should look fit, hey. He should look fit. He looks fit. Yeah. Tell you. I do a job. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a weekend for that. He could probably still go in a fullback. Eddie Kerr could probably still play for Kilkenny. Um, yeah. I don't know if anyone saw this. I think you actually picked up Skell on the competition that was taking place over JJ's shoulder on Sky Sports. Did you? Yeah. Uh, you tweeted about that, didn't you? That I, did, yeah. lads haven't I saw some. Of, I don't like a picture now. I didn't realize there was a competition or anything to do with charity. I just thought it was two lads who've had a few points and said, I can put this free over. Do you know? And it took them an age to do it. And I, I don't know if they put it over or not, but they were uh, they were certainly excited to do it. Well, I believe the great Eddie Kerr got one shot and it sailed between the posts on the one shot he took. He did, yeah, yeah. Um, Tommy Marr in Kilkenny, he's uh, part of the supporters club. He's doing a charity event in Kilkenny, so he's walking between all the clubs in Kilkenny, and uh, they were finishing up uh, at half time in the Kilkenny Wexford match. And no better man than Eddie Kerr, who was involved to set up the supporters club in Kilkenny. Eddie came in and took a twenty one and, and stuck it over the bar. So uh, that was a great moment, real in the years in Kilkenny. I think Kilkenny and Wexford fans both enjoyed it. And Eddie, another man, still looking fit. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> strap him for I saw the picture of him and uh, the, I saw the picture of that and it going over the bar and he put it right over the black spot as well so Eddie Kerr has certainly not lost it over the years so that is what the guys have picked so Owen Cody Tony Kelly Shane O'Donnell Aaron Gillan and Connor Whelan are Skehill's picks and swap out Shane O'Donnell for Connor Lahan and you've got Murphs so ask the two boys if you want to have a go with them about who they've picked for the top five that brings us round to Connor Whelan then and Connor Cooney doing all the damage for Galway in Salt Hill against Dublin. Now, I want to talk about Galway and how Galway's done nothing wrong during the championship, James. But at the same time, I want to talk about Dublin's issues up front, which we talked about during the league. We're going to catch them at some point. One goal they scored in the round robin. Yeah. And their lack of goals killed them against both Leash and Westmead. And ultimately, while the Kilkenny game was very detrimental to their scoring difference, not being able to run up scores in the other matches eventually caught up with Maddie Kenny's side. Yeah, yeah. And like when I look at Dublin forwards, okay, I'll I start with Donald Burke here. You know what you're going to get out of Donald Burke. You'll get like a few points off him. You're not going to get a ridiculous Tony Kelly display where he'll, he'll rack up 17, 18 points or something crazy. So you're depending on others, especially the inside line, to do some interior damage and create some goal chances. And they've created nothing. You know, that's that's a big issue. Like, you, you can't be a tier one county looking to contest tier one honours if you're not rattling, I won't just say goals, multiple goals in games. That has to be done. Because the score lines and the shot efficiency nowadays is just so high. So if you're going to, t- again, I keep saying, if, you t- if you're going to take on the big teams who have good defences and who have great forward units themselves, you need to be rattling two, if not three goals a game. Because it's just, it's, it's just, it's a requirement now if you're going to contest and even have a victory over a big team. And it's a major deficiency. And I have, look, I have to say, it's just quality. Will that's it? They just don't have the quality. And I, and I, look, this sounds bad now, but it, they don't have the natural quality. Do you know what I mean? Because they're like, going to look at Dublin, right? They'll always be fit. They'll always be strong. And there's only so much Matty Kinney can do with them. There's only so much he can put in front of them, whether it be tactically, structure, you know, a certain clientele in certain positions. But ultimately, it comes down to that, that man getting that ball and, and doing something with it, you know? And I just don't see the quality. And it goes back to the Kinney game where I saw a multitude of balls being delivered into the full forward line and the whole host of them didn't stick. You know, that's just the quality. Like, if I, I know, I know if I send in 10 balls to Conor Whelan, I know for a fact he'll win seven or eight. And he'd hold up the defenders of the two. I know that. That's guaranteed. If I send in 10 balls to the Dublin full forward line, I, it's the reverse. I know seven or eight of them will come out. Do you know? That's, and that's, that's not a good reflection of where they're at. You know? So I know people, everyone, it's, like, it's not like soccer nowadays. When, when a team is going bad, you're pointing the finger straight away at the manager. But like in GEA, I find that a bit different. Man. I don't think it's just, that's very fair. You know? like, like it's, 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 a lot less of a, it's a lot less structure game than soccer, if you like, to a certain extent. And an awful lot more depends on the person. And like when you have an amateur team, 
like who are, who want to be there and want to try their best and want to do everything they can. You know, it's a lot different soccer. So I don't buy the whole oh, it's Matty Keeney's or his management team are at fault. They're not because I know Matty and I know his coach Gavin Keary and they are excellent by any standard in any county. So I, I I'm looking at the players going, Jesus, like are they are they often enough? I don't know. Like, are they are they stuck on the ball wall? Are they stuck? You know, doing what they're trying, what they need to do off the pitch to bring up, bring up their. Like, again, the word I use is quality. Well, and I, I just I have that question, and it's a big question. And like, if they're going forward, if let's say Matty does walk away or step down, or whatever, who comes in and takes them? Like, they, they, I think even the hurling coach and maybe a technical coach is is far more important than, than a manager who's going to get them going on a passion base or get them going to a different structure. Structure is one thing, and like Murphy agreed with me, it gets you so far. It does. It, it helps you nullify the opposition. And try gets you get your own game plan going, but it comes down to quality, and they just don't have it. Yeah, it takes you back to chat I had with the guys in OTBM before the league was kind of about halfway through. It was the break week, and we were talking about where Dublin were at, and Dublin had just beaten Tipperary, I think, at that stage. And I still think that Dublin are very good from one to eight, and obviously in Brooke they've got a really good free taker who is going to score, and he scored five from play against Galway on top of his freeze, but. Like 14 of their scores came from him which is far much of a far too much for a line one player and the rest of their forward line just don't offer enough and then when it comes to these big games it's Groundhog Day I think year after year with Dublin and I would agree with you Skella I don't know what Maddie Kenny can do if he stays on to try and bring them a level on from this so we're probably already looking at candidates but, to take Dublin over but like if you you just said about the 14 points will there that, that was 66% of their scores yeah so if I'm an opposition manager, I'm saying, lads, get into Gronenberg, tie him up, and you've automatically nullified almost a third of the scores. Yeah. It's just too much. It's, it's, not, it's not enough from the rest of them. Well, it means they're almost reliant on another team having an off day. So say, take the Wexford win, where Burke's scoring contribution was enough to get them into a winning position in that game, but still Wexford had a very off day in front of goal. If Wexford had been on it in front of goal, Dublin would have been in trouble in that game in Wexford Park. Mm. And that's not been smart after the fact. It's just Dublin didn't score enough to get themselves into a comfortable position for all the hurling they did at various stages during the game. I think they go for a new manager, Murph, most likely now. Um, probably the end of Maddie Kenny's era. There's probably a few candidates to stand out. Like Davy Fitzgerald almost felt like he was pitching for it live on the Sunday game last night with the conversation. Did you hear that? Yeah. Now, right, let Murphy answer first because I know the scale will will have plenty to say about Davy. So, <laughs> what, what do you think about Davy as a potential uh, Dublin manager first, Murph? Yeah. Uh, Tell the truth, Murph. I, 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 look, it's 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 a tough one, Davy. Look, uh, it's probably obvious to say Davy seems to get a, a savage reaction out of out of teams um, initially, and he gets one. It seems to be very intense then for maybe one or two years. But like you hear the Wexford lads, Wexford lads speak very highly of him and so on. Um, but it, it seems to be very intense for two or three years. Is that what Dublin need? Is that what they need at the moment now to grab a hold of this group of players, give them an intense two or three years where they kind of have a siege mentality and they build a bit of spirit? Maybe it is. I, I, I don't know. But again, you know, I suppose D- Davy is, is a character that it mightn't. Does he sit with Dublin GA at the moment? Would be like, you know, Anthony Daly was a brilliant fit and he really built a really good Dublin uh, crew of players there who who were just a great they were a very tough team to play against and he kind of realised what he had what he had to work with and, and put a really good spin on it what would Davy do if he went up there I, I, I don't know um, I don't know is it what, what Dublin need at the moment um, it, it's a tough one because as well like we're, we're talking about Dublin there and they're really lacking in forwards at the moment so you know to turn and look at what manager could go in and turn that Dublin team around it's it, it's tough you know because Dublin it's not a case of any one manager goes in and changes that in one year it's a few years it looks like the Dublin are going to be coming back to where we saw Dublin let's say in the late 2010s um, or sorry early 2010s and so on and those Dublin teams Davy was making the pitch for it he looks like he, he, he's a, he wants to do the job but I think what you'll see there is Dublin, Dublin have to decide with Davy. Like, would it be good for Dublin? And that's not to be hard on Davy or anything. But he brings a lot with it in terms of even the legacy of the next manager who comes in. It's big boots to fill, and it's there's a lot of things there in the style of play and so on. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's for that's for Dublin. That's for Dublin to answer. But I think Dublin. Dublin look, Dublin. Bottom line is they, to, to try and go now and pick one manager and think that's going to solve everything. It's not going to be the case. They're a little bit further back than that. They need to find out a few more players to help out the likes of Donald Burke. Um, you know, even the likes of Chris Crummy. Chris Crummy has been moved around quite a lot, like you know. And for him, he's such a good player, but he he can't really settle into the team because he's been right half back, he's been centre forward, he's been everywhere. You know, very similar to Liam Rush. So I think that 
what that says is that Dublin need an influx of a good few players and then you know okay you give a manager a chance at that stage to be really competitive but they just don't seem to have the personnel there so I think we can talk about is Davy the right man is he not the right man is there any other person out there that could get a response out of this Dublin team to bring him to a Leinster final and, and win Leinster I don't know at the moment um, so but look Davy to Dublin I probably I wouldn't say maybe a good fit for Dublin at the moment don't worry Murph Scal won't hold back on this Scal is Davy the right guy for Dublin uh, he's not no um, I, I, I'm i looking at Kilkenny man for the Dublin job and I'm looking at Kilkenny, yeah I am yeah. Yeah, because again, I, I you have to draw cast your mind, cast, cast your mind back to when he took over the leash job, and the the impact, not the effect, the impact he put on leash, and, and what he got out of them. And granted that that ended in, you could say in bad terms if you like, whether it be for, for financial issues or whatever, or accessibility to players or to, to field, etc. And he left for for whatever reason. So I think is he a good fit to Dublin? He certainly he certainly fits well. Do you know, like he's he's he seems like he's got a real good he's a real good person to say, and and that. Uh, He's the type of mold of a, of a person that you'd see in a in a in a job as high profile, and whether we like it or not, any job in the capital is a high profile job, regardless if they're the top two or three or not. So, taking that job comes with a lot, comes with enough baggage, whether it be from media, or from supporters alike. So, I think he'd be a good fit, you know. So, rather than saying, you know, why wouldn't David get the job, I'd be looking towards more why wouldn't Eddie Brennan go for it and take it? Why wouldn't they go after? So, I again, respect to Matt, to Matt Kinney. He's put in, I think, is it four seasons in Dublin at this stage? Yeah, so he's fourth season, yeah. Yeah, like so he's he's done all he can for them at this stage. It brought them to to a certain point. So I think it it could be time for a changeover. And I think a lad of Eddie, Eddie Brennan's mould and his persona, you know, would be uh, would be the right one to go. And plus, he, he's the type of lad that I, I, even when you follow him on Twitter, everything he says is correct. Like it seems correct. You know, when you, when you see him in interviews, it sounds good. Like he's the type of lad that you'd like to follow. Yeah, I uh, I wouldn't like to lose him from OTB's uh, Monday roundups on hurting on the uh, evening show, but hey, if that's what has to happen, that's what has to happen. Look, I sacrifice. think it's <laughs> exactly all these sacrifices have to be made. Like, look, I think Eddie is almost the perfect fit here. He's the first person that jumped to mind when the conversation was on last night because he's been involved with Kula coaching for the last couple of years. Uh, handed out Dublin's defeat with Leash back in 2019, so he masterminded a defeat against them. Um, he could probably get Niall Corcoran back interested and involved to go back in as part of his management team who knows the Dublin lads and has been involved in Dublin hurling it almost seems too perfect to fit if they were uh, on the lookout for manager I think Eddie Brennan would be perfect for them and I think Eddie would probably be not to speak from keen enough I would think to get back into inter-county management after a couple of years away from it so yeah that would be an interesting <coughs> fit I think um I think Davey will be back in employment next year. I'm not just 100 percent sure where he's going to be. I mean, obviously, he seems to be enjoying his work with the Cork Camogie team currently. But let's see. Last night, definitely, he was seemed to have the itch to get back into coaching too, as opposed to breaking down games on the TV. The, the, the Sunday game was interesting, <laughs> though. Like, I mean, we're meandering ever so slightly, but why not on a hurling podcast? Did you feel bad, Murph, for the fact that Derek McGrath was taken online because that quote that he gave on the Sunday game, I think it was just after the league final that ended up getting picked up where he said whoever beats Waterford this year is going to win the Lee McCarthy a lot of fans seem to have screenshotted that along the way and were trying to use it against Derek McGrath last night at the time it wasn't that unreasonable a thought that Waterford were the form team in the country no like I mean you, you would have had a lot of people like that would have said that, that exactly that Waterford or you know it's between Waterford and Limerick we were saying it here for so many weeks and it's only recently in one or two podcasts now that we're saying that obviously Waterford are gone now but just that Waterford suddenly kind of went off a cliff face there that he just disappeared um, yeah it's taken out of context the screenshot that's something that he said a few weeks ago that was very valid and you know he was making an opinion and he was standing up behind his opinion saying that you look this Waterford team all the indications are that they're going to go very close and if someone pips them in the semi-final or whatever it might be well you'll go very close to going up the steps um, of course now that they're after losing lo- losing three games it's, it's easy to turn around and, and take apart one statement but yeah I think people are being hard on him like I mean it's not like he said it last weekend even after a Cork defeat where it would be apparent that actually Watford are in trouble here you know he said it a good few weeks ago where a lot of people would agree with you and did agree with him at the time so to turn around and make that statement last night when Watford were gone I think it's it's very uh, it, it's too easy to try and turn around and turn on a fella last night so I think people are being very hard on Derek McGrath for saying that he made what he what he thought was a very good call at the time and I certainly would have agreed with him at the time to a certain extent anyway um, that you know if, if someone is beating Watford all bar Limerick if another team beats Watford they'll go a long way well we weren't to know that 
you know, the way the results were going to go, that Cork were going to beat them, that didn't look apparent at the time. And then and then Clare would go and beat them as well. So um, I think people are being a little bit hard on Derek McGrath there. Look, again, he, he, he does a lot of podcasts, he does a lot of interviews, so he makes a lot of statements. So to turn on him, and a Watford man as well, I think is a little bit hard on him. Yeah, don't use our hot takes against us, people. I'm sure if you go back to episode <laughs> three or four, we were probably waxing lyrical about Waterford. We definitely mentioned that Waterford looked like they had the deepest panel, how they looked in great form. Liam Cowell's a great tactician. They've shown in the league that they're able to beat the teams around them. They got to the league final, blew Cork away. Understandable that people thought the Waterford were going to be there. And then even after the Limerick game, I think most of us kind of went, you know what, they've, they've closed the gap. It's no longer a case now of being double digits defeats like in the All-Ireland Final and Semi-Final. This is a Waterford team who would relish going to a Munster Final. And the wheels came off in the last couple of games. These things happen. Again, I don't think anyone would have called Wexford last week turning it round, going up to beat Kilkenny. I don't think too many people would have expected Cork after the first two games to qualify with the way they played. Even with Tipperary's issues, I don't think anyone thought we'd be talking about them losing all of their games and potentially facing a relegation playoff. But that's half the fun of championship. I would be horrible if it was predictable and the four or five teams who did well in the league were the ones who had qualified. In the end, as it worked out, by the way, I was just thinking about this on the way home last night, we were only actually wrong in the end about one of our predictions of the six teams to qualify. And that was Waterford not going through and Clare going through instead. So even as wrong as we were, you know, our our final result wasn't too bad in the end. I was also thinking about the Sunday game because, Skellen, you and I were chatting on the radio around about the time that the coverage went out. <coughs> did, did you see the debate that took place on the Sunday game live where they talked about the split season? Um, for it to be a debate, well, there has to be contrasting views. I'd, I'd agree. I'd agree. Uh, and I'm sure I'll probably get a message from... <laughs> Although, otherwise, it's propaganda. <laughs> yeah. As the host of this pod now, I have to try and represent both views or I'm going to end up getting a DM at some point saying that <laughs> we were ragging on the Sunday game and being unfair. But the truth of it is, right, and let's all be honest about this, it suits some journalists and it suits the TV coverage for the inter-county season to stretch all the way into late July and into early August because it means there's more games to cover. It means there's more space for the games to be on. And... People can't argue they don't have a skin in the game. That, that's yeah. just the truth of it. And people can argue there's no agenda or whatever else. I think the fact that this debate has now happened, and yeah, I would loosely say debate when you've got three people who are arguing almost exactly the same point. It's not much of a debate when that happens. This has now happened twice, before the first split season has even been completed. But the thing that I couldn't hold my tongue on, Skell, was after what we talked about last week, where Joanne opened the conversation talking about what a pity it was that Westmead's year was over and that we weren't going to see more of them and they'd done so well. We couldn't bloody see them the week before because it was shot on a camcorder. <laughs> I, I know, like... Jeez, really? Was it even like... Did Dale make a statement about when the Dublin Club Championship was starting and it was wrong? Yeah, it started you know, in July and he was trying to claim it was starting later. Like, if you're, if you're trying to make... A, <clears throat> if you're trying to make a, a, a sound judgmental decision you need all the information at hand right that's why I prefer to review as opposed to preview so I would like I want the year to go ahead let the county championship play out inter county championship should I say let the club championship play out and then let's review and let's look at the pros and cons and then tweak it accordingly like just tweak it and see can we fix it next year rather than just coming in like we're not even what we're 23rd of May so we're, at, we're not even halfway through the year club, club championships haven't even started and we're already just uh, you know signing off and saying no we have to go back to the old way and I, I found a really kind of strange that the, the guys who were kind of saying this were all in their own playing careers when they were when they were involved were in, was in a straight knockout championship yeah. you know that, that's, that's what they experienced and like I know let's say from, from, from me grow, growing up let's say watching Hurling obviously the county game you know, impacted you right it was great because it was kind of like you know nearly spurs you want to become a player so that's it right but I didn't I didn't need 20 games every 20 weeks you know like I wanted to play the game that's the first thing so like if you're if you're a child great watching the game but then you want to play and give them ample time to play. So I, I just think it's it's a flawed. Again, I use the word debate loosely. I want to review it uh, as opposed to be pre previewing it. And again, like the club players, they keep on about the ninety seven percent. Let the ninety seven percent have their time as well. Now, now that I'm obviously retired for a couple a couple of years and, and have had a full season, you know, like club is the be all and end all of it. You know, that's 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 regardless of what anyone else says or other. You can put everything aside with regards to TV, media, finance, etc., etc. Club is the be all and end all. So. I think that they deserve to have their own slot in the calendar. And when I say slot, an uninterrupted slot. That's the key I, thing. I say all this, by the way. I really like Sheedy. I really like Dalo. Um, I know oh, it's not personal. Players. It's not yeah. personal. No, it's not like I would say like, that you want, you I love them as players and people. Yeah. But with regards to that, 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 what they're saying, the words come out of the mouth for that specific topic. I just don't agree with it. Yeah. And I, just, I just have a contrasting opinion. That's all. I think it was, a, it was an editorial decision to have the chat. I, I think it's a case of you do it when you know you've got a peak audience and... 
certain people within the national writing side of things in the GA have made exactly the same argument and you hear all this stuff about oh it's giving up ground to other sports and whatever else look if it means that the vast vast majority of club players get a chance to actually have a championship which they can plan for that they're no longer cancelling holidays that they can actually have the best of ground to play it rather than finding out games at short notice in October <coughs> and November a condensed schedule to try and play the championships out I will happily trade that off for losing two weeks I, but, I think we, will, we could review like, it in a few years time give it a sorry chance sorry to interrupt you like, but like, if, you're, if you're a parent right and you're, you've, you've got children who are playing the game the reason we lose ground on rugby and soccer is because they've got a fixed calendar and they do not budge so parents can plan accordingly they know when the sessions are, they know when the games are. There's never any stupid cancellations over the wind blowing the wrong direction like you have in GAA. <laughs> you know? So like give your six months or whatever it is for county, and give your X amount of months, whatever it is for 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 uh, for club. But if you're the bigger debate, right? And I, I had this out with a couple of people yesterday was if you are to prolong the the championship, you're gonna have to are you gonna have to rerun the, one of the, the, the provincial championships? Are you gonna have to turn to a, a, a major league based format where you're creating more games? And if, if that happens, then you're into a wider debate because we know how Munster feel about their own provincial championship. And I love Munster championship. Yeah. But the minute, the, minute, the minute you mention the word change and Munster's in the same the same sentence, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> don't touch it, it's sacred. And like the best games I've ever seen, they say, were, have been for Munster in my opinion. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I wouldn't want to touch it either. I, I think it's fine. As you said, we'll give it a couple of years and see how it goes. Worry not. We're going to mention Leash and Westmead in a moment. The Westmead's a fantastic win. But Murph, that brings up the point about the structures, right? I think, this is me, if Kerry beat Antrim in Crow Park on Saturday week, the Munster Championship need to make a reform to allow Kerry in. Yeah, there, sh- uh, there should be no relegation playoff here. No, there should there shouldn't be. I mean, you know, Munster have five teams and uh, Leinster have six. Why can't Munster go ahead and just bring in Kerry? I mean, all you have to do is go and look at Joe Fortune over the weekend when he was interviewed. Like, I mean, really positive interview at the end of at the end of the season saying you know and we saw lots of good things come out of it even the few small statements which might seem kind of flippant but the ones where play, uh, Joe Fortune was saying about um, supporters coming onto the pitch and getting autographs by Westmead that, that's gaining ground you know they're very small steps but it's gaining ground drawn with Wexford you know going really competitive with Kilkenny in the first round for, for 35 minutes okay you know pushing Dublin the whole way as well okay the, the, the Galway match didn't go their way but that that's, that's Westmead and they're you know there, there's your test case there for why should Kerry be involved and like I, in these instances you should also as well no more than the penalty debate last week about the under 20s or the minors you know what do Kerry feel about this I think Kerry would want to be up playing in the Munster Championship and they're talking about what if they take take beatings and all these things what did Waterford take off Clare over the weekend you know what did Tipperary take off Cork over the weekend you know they were beatings um, I'm not saying that Kerry want to go out and take hammers off these teams but why not let them stick their toe in the water and again no more than we're going through a phase here of uh, trying out these new split seasons why not bring Kerry in and not have them in the playoff and why are they the difference yeah. um, the exception to the cause of you win you get to come in and play and you get to stand up because otherwise at what stage do these lads bridge the gap you know um, so yeah I, I fully agree with you there I think there needs to be a small bit of a reform and bring Kerry in bring him into the party and let them okay let them probably go through one one or two maybe tough years let's be honest about it but they're headed in the right direction so they need to be rewarded um, and I don't see why not yeah Kerry beat Antrim in the last round of the Joe McDonough to qualify for the final awfully happened in pole position as we spoke last week to qualify but they were beaten by five points in the end at home against Carlo uh, but for Carlo unfortunately they needed Antrim to do them a favour Kerry won that game and it's going to be Kerry and Antrim again as the curtain raiser on Leinster final day coming up on Saturday week and the winners of that competition if it's Antrim they go directly into the Leinster Championship and they will replace Leash while if Kerry win it means that Tipperary will have to train for five weeks to get ready for a relegation playoff they have to train James as it works out the Tipperary panel for at least two more because they're going to have to be ready for Saturday week again I don't know how much training they're actually going to do in that period but they have to stay together as a group and potentially if Kerry win they won't be able to play the relegation playoff before the 25th of June because Kerry would have a preliminary All-Ireland quarter final one way or another. That's a long time to wait for Tipperary if there is a relegation playoff anyway. Yeah, that's a bigger structural problem now than what we're talking about. You know, and like if we're on about to say we're losing traction to other sports, why don't we give Kerry some some look prime time slots in the Munster Championship if they come through? You know, like and to be honest, like I was saying just in my own head, Murphy, as you're speaking there, even if Kerry are beaten, even if they don't win the Drummond, let's say, and Antrim do come through, put them in Munster anyways. Put them in. Do you know what I mean? Just put them in and see how it goes. So you know, try again, try it out and then review. Because they like they're obviously challenging. They're obviously competing against 
everyone knows flipping football is, is religion down there so they're trying their best to to go up against it so if you want to give young young people uh, a bit of a i suppose a reason to play the game give them some prime time games against let's say Let's, let's bring down Limerick into, down to Clarny. Do you know what I mean? Wouldn't kids love to see Keane Lynch in the flesh? You know, or, or, and I know that I'm pointing to opposition players, but it would draw attraction and it just creates like a snowball effect and you'd hope it would grow. So that's kind of the size of it. And like you're right, we forgot Westmead. You know, they didn't take too many beatings. You know, like, so like, they, 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 they behave fierce well. But again, it's all incremental improvement. You can't expect them to go in and challenge, boom, straight away. You have to kind of assist these counties, whether we like it or not, and give them a prolonged period of time for them to, uh, to try and get themselves accustomed to tier one yeah because look Westmead lads they've got five trophies in recent years a couple of division two A's uh, a couple of Kyo Cups and here they are now going back yeah. up to the Leinster Championship having won the Joe McDonough last season and now secured their status for this year after their first year back up so to me that's sustained success that is growing and going up the ladder and staying there and importantly now they're going to have division one hurling for <coughs> next year you know, with some of their performances back in the league, remember I was chatting to Joe Fortune and we played him the interview out in the show after the league final and he was talking about the fact that the players had locked themselves in and were having a conversation about where they were going for the rest of this year. They felt that maybe even the Division 2A final might be too far away. Well, they've been in really good form since then. We complimented them last week for the draw that they got against Wexford, but always the most important game was going to be the leash game. And even when Joe Fortune said at the weekend afterwards that he wanted to go and have a cut at every team in Leinster while Leash seemed to have an attitude after the first couple of defeats that Westmead was always going to be the important game, they had to still make sure that they didn't get defeated so that they would still be in Leinster next year. Mm-hmm. What a second half performance. They were 112 to 111 up at half time, Westmead, having played against a little bit of a wind. And in the second half, they won by 16 points to have an 18 point victory in all. That is a remarkable, remarkable win for Westmead. Niall Mitchell, who probably could have been accused at uh, different times this year, of being too selfless that he would try and pass on the ball one or two times too many he scored two goals Owen Keyes who's been really good for them this season also banging in a couple of goals just hurled really well across the team we spoke about Davy Glenn a few times he's been in really good form uh, for Westmead this season across league and championship Angus Clark back to his best at the end of the season Niall O'Brien also contributing a goal at the weekend the truth is that they hammered a leash team who were low in confidence and low in players and Murph, this is some story for Westmead now to stay up on their own merits and to be going up to Division 1 next year. They're rooting themselves now in the top 10 in the country. Yeah, yeah, and you said it exactly there. It's sustained success, you know, as in they're, they're plugging away for a good few years. And no more than a few of the other things we referred to earlier in the show, you don't just turn this on overnight. You know, you need to go through the good days and the bad days. And, and Westmead have done that. You know, they've gone through the good days and the bad days. And you know they've 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 stuck to their task. They, they've it's it's just been really and it's it, it seems kind of funny in one way. And you don't want to come across patronising at any stage. But another team would be a little bit disappointed with with where they are. But for it's relevant to Westmead that this is a success because they're now competing and they're now like that's a big like the draw against Wexford. That is a big result for them. You know it's it's a big scalp and it's a big marker to show how they've come along and that they were able to compete seventy minutes against a team this week that we were saying you know are going to do real. You know, are going to cause teams problems in the qualifiers. A really good Wexford team. A Wexford team that we had also up near the top of our uh, top five. I think at one stage, Skettle, you had him as the number one in the country. So, look, that's that's Westmead's lot. They're after doing really well. I think they can be really proud of their success so far and what they've done and what the platform they've set them for themselves now going forward as well. Like Teams will find it very tough now to, to knock Westmead down. Um, whoever finds themselves in Leinster over the next few years, they'll find it really tough against Westmead. And again, going back to our earlier one, Kerry should be afforded that opportunity also as well. Kerry should be afforded, and if they go back down, they go back down, fine. But... I actually agree with you, James. Yeah, one way or another, they should actually just be brought into Munster and say, "Listen, you know, wel- welcome into Munster. You've 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 proved yourself over a few years now. Let's have a look at it. Let's see what happens." I don't think anybody in Kerry, in the hurling circles, or Stephen Malumphy or anyone, would turn down the opportunity to actually go and do that. It was interesting as well, Scal, from a psychological point of view, where Westmead were going into this game. I think next week we'll, we'll have a chat with Derek McNicholas, their longest serving player. And when I spoke to him initially a couple of weeks ago, he said, we've got to focus 100% on the leash game. I'd love to have a chat with you guys on the pod about the Wexford draw, which almost felt like a win with the uh, gravity of the result. But he said the most important thing is that we don't mess up against leash. Killian Doyle also said after the game on the radio at the weekend <coughs> that it was a strange situation where they wanted to guard against any idea of complacency that you perform well against Wexford and then you go out flat. He said they need they knew they needed to be 100% on it in Port Leash if they were going to stay up. 
it's great to see that they actually had that mentality yeah. that they didn't allow last week to become too much of a deal in their own heads and they went out and put a big performance in last weekend yeah like a club mate of mine who's with Galway at the minute Damien Jice he was a great phrase he always says like like never get too too high and never get too low so you don't get too high after a victory and too low after a defeat and I had a slight concern to be honest that with, with, the, with the I suppose the huge positivity and the great furore around the, the Westmead draw against Wexford that they could possibly possibly slip up against Leash but they didn't they put that to bed <laughs> and they put it to bed emphatically you know so, it's, it's, so it's, it, that shows a good sign of a, of a team that they're able to you know put aside what was probably their, their best result in the last few years obviously in terms of status and move on to the next one and dismantle uh, Wheat, Leash and dismantle them you know, pretty conclusively. So again, it's another step, another notch, and they're moving on in the right direction. Just want to play a bit of uh, Seamus Cheddar Plunkett here. This is what uh, Cheddar had to say when he was on Midlands 103 after the game at the weekend. He was asked about his own position and also the idea of whether Leash might be better dropping into the Joe McDonough Cup to be one step down to try and take two steps forward. You need to be consistently playing at that level um, and having the volume of players and volume of quality players to continue to play at that level and be able to take the hits then I suppose of numbers of injuries and all of that and we'll see what that does for um, even a, a county with the history of Tipperary when they're missing a number of players you know we see the hit that it makes on them but I, I just don't want to answer your question in that vein you've asked me a question about the quality of Hurl and I think this team has it and I think this team uh, um, has the ability to really contest at this level but it's going to have to get back and regroup. Um, I think there's a lot of positives from this year. Um, I think maybe half our panel is probably under 21. Uh, the under 20s had a good championship this year. The minors had a good championship last Monday night. There's clearly young players coming on to, to you know to fill those jerseys and contest those jerseys. I suppose first of all and have a go out of it. Although they have a lot of ground to make up to this level of hurling. Um, so I, I think there is you know there is. Where's the best place to do that? I wonder. Uh, look you know, at, when you're trying to develop these assets, because it's uh, not that, much use to them getting tanked. Like that. And I, 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 I think that's a slightly different question. That's a development question, um, and you cannot. There's no point in talking about developing players in the senior dressing room. They should come into the senior dressing room fully okay, developed. Yeah, that I said. Yeah. That's that's a sort of a different answer yeah. or a different question. I think to, to, to be asked. Uh, but if you ask, um, is the quality in our dressing room? Yes, I do believe it is. Um, how we got it out of it? No, we don't. No, we haven't. And and um, you know, that that that's going to have to get analysed and figured out about how that, how that needs to get done. Cheddar, what's your future now? Do you, do you plan to stick around or do you, do you give it a couple of weeks and see how it falls? Uh, those, we just put our heart and soul into this game, uh, Tomás, this week. Um, absolutely no thoughts given to anything else. Um, all of those stuff is down the road, you know, across those bridges um, a little bit later on. Right, that was Seamus Cheddar Plunkett uh, speaking after that 18-point defeat for Leash. It's been a kind of a miserable summer for the Murphy off the back of the league. They put in that huge performance against Antrim, which ensured their Division 1B status for next season. But since then, it's been a real slog for Leash. And losing injuries, losing confidence, as Cheddar said, he feels that his panel are good enough to be playing Division 1 and playing senior hurling. He doesn't agree with the idea that maybe dropping into the Joe McDonough might be good for their development. It's a weird one though because Westmead played in Division 2A of the league and it didn't affect them in Leinster. Michael Fenley, the Offaly manager, was saying at the weekend that almost the perfect balance would be to play as strong as possible in one competition and maybe slightly lower in the other because it's such a step up with the speed and the physicality against the senior teams. I can kind of see both sides of the argument here. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with you. My general opinion on these things would be you try and play at the highest standard where you can because maybe an air of complacency can, can, can step in if you go too far back. I'd agree, you know, it is a good point to make to say that, you know, playing strong in one side and maybe taking a step back on the other side might benefit you. It would, you know, and I can see how it would because you're not fully, you know, taking your lot out of being in the strongest side you can be in. You know, you still have one foot in one side, one foot in the other. Um, but, I'd, you know, I'd agree probably more so with Cheddar Plunkett. Um, like the case, the case I would use would be sometimes you often hear of of underage teams potentially stepping back in, let's say, within their own co- county and club, and stepping back to maybe, let's say, in Kilkenny we have Ryan A and Ryan B and all this, and maybe stepping back to Ryan B, go win Ryan B, and then step back up into Ryan A. For me, it kind of gives you a false positive of where you are because Leash, bar the injuries Leash had, Leash had a really good chance of staying up or you know, as in competing really well in Leinster and maybe beating Westmead and so on. Leash got a bad draw of it really with the injuries. They had so many injuries, what could they do? 
Um, and I don't think Leash are the team that need to step back, if I'm honest. You know, again, Michael Fenley talking about Offaly and different teams talking about themselves. But for Leash's lot, I think if they get their all, their strongest 15 back on the team, you know, or back on the pitch, they're in the place where they can stay and compete and, and take scalps off teams um, once everything is going in the right direction for them. So I don't think Leash are a team that have to do that. I just think you know things didn't go in Leash's favour, and I, and I agree as well. We said earlier that maybe Leash targeted Westmead, the Westmead match, whereas the likes of Westmead just said, "Look, we'll go at every match here and try and win it." Maybe Leash have to step back and have a bit more of a, a bit more of a look at that. That let's go and target matches and get back to what Leash were doing initially when they were in against these teams, and go and say, "And let's just have a crack at it." And let's go. Maybe Leash have stepped away from that a little bit. Um, but the injuries certainly haven't helped them and I'd agree with Cheddar Plunkett in, in their case in Leash's case that I don't think it would do them any favours to really step back to go two steps forward certainly with other teams that may do a favour but I, I, I don't think for a, for a team like Leash or a county like Leash I think they have a bit more going for them that they can stay going at it um, but they, unfortunately for them they don't have much leeway in terms of losing players they just can't afford to do them they need, they need everyone on the pitch to be competitive yeah, mm-hmm. and look, that's a conversation that Leash County Board and Cheddar Plunkett probably have to say, uh, talk about. You know, Cheddar was fairly clear that he hadn't reviewed the season yet, but a big review was needed in how they played. And I, I have no doubt that if Cheddar Plunkett feels is not the right, uh, he's not the right man to be there. I think he'll step away. He's not the type of guy who would dig his heels in and try and stay around when he's not required. But Leash have got probably decisions to make at the end of the season. But I think the injuries have to be a huge uh, mitigating factor when they look back at their season. So Westmead say up, they're definitely going to be in the Leinster Championship. Leash are now looking for a favour from Kerry because if Kerry win the McDonough, there'll be no relegation from the Leinster Championship, and Leash will get a reprieve. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, before we go into Munster, um, just want to clarify a message I got from Derek Lynch because Derek Lynch, who we spoke about from Clare FM, bumped into Scale yesterday and was uh, saying. Uh, go have a chat with Will about something that he brought up on the pod <laughs> last week where I was looking at um, his tweets. Now, I did not mean, by the way, uh, Derek, to misrepresent uh, you and what you were saying. So he sent me two DMs on Saturday. I was actually really busy in work. So the first thing I thought of was I'll give his, his side on the pod. And that's the fair way to do because we discussed his comments on the pod last week. And I will DM him back after we record this and uh, talk about it as well. So uh, Derek said we misrepresented what he said last week. The impact which winded... Aaron Fitzgerald because we spoke about Aaron Fitzgerald going down and holding his stomach after Hegarty's hurley had come around and our feeling was that he had gone down and made the most of the incident and I thought that Derek had been saying that he had been winded a couple of plays before and we discussed the fact that if he was winded he hit the ground straight away there's no way that Fitzgerald would have went and tussled further with Hegarty and then <coughs> had the impact of the winding personally I think that's still the case but just for Derek wants to clarify that it wasn't that many seconds before that many plays before that actually it was an incident that happened probably four or five seconds beforehand and he sent me a screenshot which I'll throw up in the YouTube just to show that there is a coming together with Hegarty and with Fitzgerald a little bit before the incident with the hurl and he's saying that's the time that he was winded from the contact with Hegarty so hopefully that clarifies it that we were talking about it being a few seconds beforehand And that was me, I think, maybe literally just misreading the chain of tweets as opposed to any intention to misrepresent. But I'll stick up a picture and let the viewers decide. uh, Because it was one of those things last week, even on the YouTube, lads, I noticed it was probably the busiest we had in terms of comments all season. And nearly all the comments that came in, both on the live version on the Tuesday night and afterwards, were people arguing, Fitzgerald was wrong. No, he's right to go down. Hegarty was wrong. Hegarty's getting himself in trouble all the time. It was like a constant stream of debate around what happened last week. So hopefully now, after we've just clarified what Derek said, that we can actually kind of close the door on Fitzgerald and Hegarty and the discussion we had from last week. But it's always good fun to see everyone commenting. So by all means, uh, throw your comments together. Unfortunately, we don't have Instagram questions this week. I actually kind of enjoy these over the last few weeks because some silly goose in Off the Ball has managed to lock our account out uh, so we've been unable to use it. So this is the joy of two-factor authentication. We'll hopefully have it back up and running for next week. Uh, But somebody has locked out the account and we're not sure what phone it's attached to. So if someone in the office could find out uh, where it's sending the emails to, that'd be great. But right now, we're unable to log into the Instagram. We might actually set up a hurling pod uh, Instagram or Twitter account and you can send your abuse and your questions there. But uh, that's one for next week as opposed to this uh, week. Right. Breaking news, Will. Go on. Uh, Paul Murphy has just passed out Willow Callan in the defensive rankings. Oh yeah, and I'd say he's passed me up by quite a bit because this, <laughs> oh, this window geez, is gone. Yes. This window has gone horrifically for me because this is the one I talked about this last week. So you're locked in for the last two weeks of the round robin with the transfers, right? I went to literally 
change at a minute past the window closing. I think I'd come back down the stairs, maybe, sorry, maybe two minutes past five. <laughs> came back down the stairs, logged in, had all my ideas in place. I actually had them written down in a Google Doc on my laptop and I was ready to make the changes. And would you believe who's left as my captain? Stephen Bennett. I was oh. even half hopeful that Bennett might have a big game against Clare when it was all on the line. I thought maybe not all is lost in this game week if he goes and has a big game. And then someone in the Waterford camp scale leaked out the team, which to me shows a very interesting insight into that Waterford panel who seems so together uh, throughout the last year or two. And next thing, teams are getting leaked out before a must-win game. Rule number one in a county team, or any team, sorry, club team, county team, whatever it is, you keep everything in-house. <laughs> That's it, regardless of what is said, what is done, what happens, what team is named, tactics, everything remains in-house. And it says to me, like, and I, I, know, I know the team was out, it was out in Waterford Saturday evening, it says to me that there was a big disconnect and a lack of trust amongst them. That's a bigger concern. So, and you know what? That actually offers a bit of an explanation as to why there has been such a, a capitulation over the last, what did you call it, two or three weeks? It actually offers some, some reasoning to behind what has, ha- what has happened because, like we said a few minutes ago, you rewind four weeks back and we were all singing their praises thinking this is, this is the time now they're going to take on Limerick. And it's just been the house of cards that fallen. <laughs> Do you know? Because like, if I was reading John Milan's comments about this, and I'd actually <coughs> agree with him. So under Cahill, we've heard nothing about this Waterford camp, about any kind of issues within it, any kind of strife, any arguments. It was like a sealed house. Yeah. And next thing, things start to go against the Murph, and we start to hear about the team selections. We start to hear about maybe people being disgruntled. It's amazing how things turn when a couple of results go against the team. Yeah, it is. And um, I look, from, from being in setups now as well, I'd often, when you're losing, when things aren't going well, some of these are just are, are rumours, you know, so trying to put your finger on what's true and what's a rumour, but obviously there, there must be something there in terms of, like the team getting out, that's, like James was saying, that's rule number one, you cannot do that, and um, it's it's definitely frustrating, like even if, when I would have been part of teams that, you know, some team, some years you'd hear absolutely nothing, every single match, nothing at all. But then other years, then you'd hear one or two things, and it mightn't seem like big matches. But for for the likes of myself, I'd be going, that's an indicator here that you know someone isn't, you know, headed in the same direction as us here. That they're obviously going out and they're telling their girlfriend or they're telling their uncle or whoever the team, and which isn't great. But so it's very surprising to hear that from Washford. But um, these things usually do go hand in hand. In fairness, people do look for answers straight away. Is there's some sort of um, discontent and so on. And the fact that the team was released, I would say there probably is something there. Um, but you see Liam Cal after the game. I mean, I felt, I felt terrible for him, to be honest, because it just seemed like he could he had no answer for what was after happening. And he was very he was very open about that. He just said he couldn't put his finger on it. And for what he'd built, um, like this is very much back to the players from what I can see. I don't, I don't see this coming from Liam and his management because they've just been, from what I can see, exceptional over the last few years in terms of building what they've built. But somehow, somehow the wheels just came undone. The wheels came off the cart in the last while, and there's obviously a few things there. And it, it's not, you know, it, it's it, it's not anything to do with the hurling or the physicality or anything like that. It just comes back to maybe a little bit of attitude, um, in terms of like the attitude just slipping, belief, bit of confidence, and different things. And sometimes when those things are going against you. The few things you don't want to happen and start to happen in terms of people start talking and, and, and a few things go on that you don't want to go on. So, look, I don't want to, I suppose, say anything that might insinuate that there's something going on in Watford because I don't think there is. Just the last few weeks has been really unsettling for them and it's a pity for the for the trajectory they were on that they headed down this road and now the rumours come with it. So, I'm sure, like I was saying, there's a bit of there's a bit of truth to a few of them um, but it is interesting that John Milan is saying it for so long we've never heard anything about this Watford group and now there's a few things out there about potentially the goings on behind the scenes so it's uh, it's disappointing for Liam Cal. that's the one fellow I will say it's disappointing for Scal you were covering the game for Off the Ball we were chatting uh, on the radio about beforehand and mm-hmm. you looked at that Clare team and it's confirmed that Tony Kelly's not going to be involved John Collins not going to be involved next thing Clare without <laughs> two of their most important players and for the last two years we've all been talking about Clare a different animal if Tony Kelly's not available if he gets injured he's so important to them well, Clare went out and hammered the league champions without Tony Kelly. And I actually, I called, when we were talking beforehand, I said that, like, Watford have to win this game. Clare missing two of their biggest players. So I'm going to have to say Watford are going to win it. Because their life is absolutely on the line. So they have to die with the boots on. And, jeez, I was wrong. I was, like, completely wrong. And even the boys in Clare FM were saying, if you look to the Clare team who have scored, was it, 331, you'd ask yourself the question, how much did Tony Kelly score? 
and the fella not even playing. It's a great question. It's a great, it great point. Like they got three twenty five from play, but it was open season. Well, it was just open season. It was a pure demolition job, and Waterford looked extremely tired. And like when you're, when you're really tired and lethargic, that's when mistakes happen. That's when the ball doesn't stick. Passes get lazy. They go all askew. Shots are all over the place, and it just there was no connection at all on the Waterford team, and it was just repetitive. It was like Groundhog Day. Same ball goes into the corner. Clare man goes out and gets it. Turns around, point, puck out. Clare win it. Same ball goes into the corner. Clare man goes out and it just kept on going for the whole day. It was just so repetitive, and Waterford couldn't do anything. Now I will say, they obviously didn't start to Stephen Bennett. They lost Connor Punchy. That's their fullback, all-star fullback and captain. They then had to move Tyg de Burke, all-star, back to fullback. He's gone after four minutes. Right, then Jimmy Barron has gone after halfway through the first half. So they've lost essentially three of their biggest players, three all stars, gone. You know, they had to move Isaac Gleason from centre to midfield, centre forward to full forward. So they were trying to muster something up, they were trying to get something going from a management perspective, but it just wasn't clicking. And then Claire, there was a real, uh, what would I say, hyperness in, in, in us yesterday. Everyone in Claire seems to have a real feel good factor. Like the crowd was 16,144 with 16,000 Claire people there. You know, that's what it felt like. And there was an energy, there was a buzz, they were singing behind the goals during the second half, you know. And so they're 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 on they're they're in a good place, Clara. But again, it's easy it's easy to do flashy things. It's easy to do night you know, the flicks and the, the special turns and the the points over over your shoulder, say, when you're fifteen points up and the crowd's behind you. So they've got a big test coming up in two weeks and I'm very interested to see how they react or how not how they react, how they get on in Turles, uh, where you'd have kind of a you'd imagine a fifty fifty crowd, although Clara do travel very well. Um, and let's see if, if Limerick have Galan back and if they have Lynch back maybe I don't know um, different animal will they have Garrett Jagger for 70 minutes most likely at this stage so like I said to you beforehand Limerick stock went up in Innes Clears did too so but Limerick, Limerick are getting people back now you know, they're getting people back so it's a very hard one to call and I won't call it now just yet <laughs> I hold my cars close to my chest I let the couple of weeks unfold until I see who's back for Limerick but uh, yeah great all, all, all round day for Clear. they're singing yeah, um, Murph, look, it couldn't be going any better for Clare currently. You were uh, praising Brian Lone, I think, overnight on social media for the job that he's done. <laughs> I think we can... You were fishing, Murph. You were fishing. <laughs> <laughs> he was fishing with a barrel of di- uh, dynamite into a barrel, is what he was fishing with, with that comment. But look, let's, let's be honest. When the end of the league came round, I think not too many of us would have expected that Clare... I think too many people outside of Clare would have expected that Clare would have topped the standings at the end of the round robin. Um, to qualify, I thought looked a big task with how Limerick, Cork, and Waterford have been going. But Clare did finish top. Clare did avoid defeat when they played against mm. Limerick, unbeaten going into a Munster final. I think you got to give Lone credit for that. Now it has helped that some of these players have come back in, and I know you might not have Shane O'Donnell right now in your top five, but after missing him for a year, he's been like transferring an all-star back into the team, and everything seems to have gone right, and they're on a complete crest of a wave. But that doesn't happen without the hard work happening in the background too. No, that's it exactly, and I suppose Twitter only allows you to explain your case to a certain degree, and like a lot of it was. I remember just watching before the match, um, and like you're saying, James, there like the before the game, um, watching it there, there seemed like just a real carnival atmosphere in Clare, and I was just thinking back to last year and the hand that Brian Lowen had been dealt. You know, you think of the COVID cases before the Wexford match, and you know, were they COVID cases and all these things, and you know, Brian Owen just held his tongue and he just went with it and he said, "Look, it, we'll go at it and we'll do our best," and they did. You know, you think of the red card down below and the Ennis Road that they had as well, like against Tipperary, like you know, and again, Lowen just got on with it and he got on with it, and he's forged something now that I think he deserves all the credit at the moment because it wasn't looking great for them, let's say last year, coming into the league and things into the championship. Hard to see where they're going to pull it from. And yeah, the Duggan coming back and Shane O'Donnell coming back, huge for them. But they deserve that break at this stage. And it was only, I was just thinking of it before the match, though, the pan to Brian Lowen, a full Ennis, um, real feel good factor, like you're saying, Scale, a real feel good factor. They went out and they performed, they're in a Munster final. And I was just looking at Lowen going, like he's gone through a few hard days and a lot of questions asked him about him as well, being bet by Antrim, um, up in Antrim as well. A lot of people were asking questions about that, like, you know, was he the man for the job? Like no one's asking that now this week. And for a man who's given such service to Claire, I was just going, Do you know what? It's great to see that sometimes hurling goes your way, you get the breaks. And regardless what happens this year, and that's not right enough, Claire, it's not saying at all that they're finished or 
whether they win or lose a Munster Championship. It's just to enjoy the moments when they're going. And I think Brian Owen just deserves it at the moment for all the hardship last year that suddenly now this year he's really, you know, there's a feel-good factor. He's, he's yeah. you know, it's really good times <clears throat> in player. And I just, you know, I just had that thought before the game the other day just to say, if you told us this 12 months ago that this is where Clare would be and that Brian Owen would be being praised on the Clare deservedly so, no one would have believed you. So for me, it was just a moment there of going, fair play to him. He deserves for everything he's done for Clare over the years. We'll have a look, Murph, next week in a lot more detail about the two provincial finals which are coming up because I think that's the right time to uh, preview as we get ready for the excitement of that final on June the 5th, which is the Sunday when they're going to meet on the Bank Holiday weekend. What a Bank Holiday weekend of hurling we're going to have with the finals between Leinster, Munster and the John McDonough. But can you see this Clare team in a, look, a very wide sense before we break down everything next week having a good chance of toppling Limerick in that Munster final? Yeah, I can. Um, and and like we said, look in fairness, we picked five five um, five best forwards in the country. And Skehill, like I mean, you're you're right. Two two of them in there from Clare. Okay, fine margin. I didn't pick someone else, but to have two of the best forwards in the country, like there's not many other Limerick lads that were pushing hard for that at the moment in current form. And that's what it's all about at the moment. It's about momentum. It's about form. Um, lots of other stuff just goes out the window um, coming into these finals as well. And I don't think Clare won't fear going in against Limerick because. Like we'll be sitting here next week, and we'll, one of us or two of us or maybe all of us will say, "Okay, Limerick are going to win this." There's going to be no pressure on Clare going into it. They'll have a little bit of internal pressure themselves and inside in the camp and wanting to win it, but they'll go down there with huge support. They go down there with some of the most dangerous forwards at the moment. Like you said, Shane O'Donnell is, you know, in hurler of the year form along with a good few other lads. Tony Kelly will come along and chip in with 16 points or whatever he's going to do. And it's made for the likes of Peter Duggan or these lads to also step up. Like, I mean, he's hurling great at the moment, but someone else seems to come from somewhere. Davy Fitzgerald, incredible over the weekend again. John Conlon to come back into it. So it's amazing now to say that I really do think they have a savage chance of toppling Nimerick. And if they get down to Turles, momentum again is the word at the moment if they can get momentum against Limerick <clears throat> who knows what could happen but Limerick have lads to come back and Limerick are the champions and they're there for a reason so like like James I nearly I need to take a week to think about it because there's just so much to unravel with and it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant to have this kind of Limerick the, the, the champions going for it and fair play to them if they win it but then you have this what would be perceived as an underdog a, t- a team that's after coming out of left of field and are now coming at them uh, it's just absolutely brilliant and I think it's going to be a classic Munster final if I'm to say that much now I think it's going to be a classic because you just have a team in Limerick who are like James is saying their stock is rising and then player who are just electric at the moment and so enjoyable to watch and very few things going wrong for them so uh, they, I think they have a brilliant chance absolutely brilliant chance um, of, 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 toppling, of toppling Limerick yeah, loads of pace, ooh la la hurling at different times. And I take James's point that when you're a bit ahead, maybe you can take a chance with the flicks and with the off the ball running and popping the ball the way they did. But even David Gerald's second goal, just lovely, lovely hurling from Clare in that game against Waterford. And Waterford have sunk without a trace after uh, winning the league final. Very disappointing campaign. Uh, two wins now, and I think it's 15 in the Munster Championship in the round robin. So uh, that just goes to show how poor their form has been, which is so confusing when they were so good in the years when we didn't have a round robin and got to an All-Ireland semi and to an All-Ireland final it kind of belies their form uh, within the Munster Championship itself um, Skell I'm going to ask you about what happens with uh, the position now with Liam Cal because there might be an argument around Tipperary even making a swift change after the year that they've had so maybe the tip job might even be available this summer but here's what Cal had to say on off the ball yesterday after the game where he cut a very frustrated figure Today is, today is obviously, as I said, very, very disappointing. Um, it's something that we won't make a, a rash decision on now. But, um, you know, you'd have to say, uh, from my side, like, you know, I just wonder what else can be done, really, to, 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 bring, him to bring these guys to the next level. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to sit down with these, these players. I have a very, very good, healthy relationship with every one of these players. They're, they're extremely honest men. And... and um, you know, before I do anything, I'll definitely sit down with, with them and, 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 and see where their heads are at first before we do anything uh, too rash. Liam, after the league, there was a certain vibe that you know you had the strongest squad. Do you think that weighed in the way in any way on 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 Waterford in general that they were being billed as the nearest challengers to Limerick, even though results did reflect that in recent years? Ah, uh, yeah. Look, what can you do? You can only control. What you can, you know, control. We 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 like to have thought we had a good a good understanding inside and in, in the environment we've created to be able to deal with the likes of that. And 
look, the, the bottom line is, if you're going to be one of the best teams in the country, you're going to have to deal with that and just, just you know, get on with it. And, um, you know, these players are going to have to learn with that because they will put themselves back in that position again because talent like that just doesn't go away overnight. And they're going to meet that obstacle again. And I suppose, like, if they do, we, we'll just have to, to deal with it that bit differently and, and just understand that we can't just curl up and die under it, like, like you know, which is... Like what has seemed to have happened over the last uh, two to three weeks, so it's it's questions that have to be answered by everybody, but particularly I suppose the players. You know, Skell, we heard um, Liam Cal speaking there, um, very dejected, understandably. I think after the campaign they've had, because everyone felt, and not just within their own camp, that this Waterford team could go deep into the summer, but they're going to be watching the rest of us like the rest of us in grounds or on the TV as opposed to playing in it. Is there an argument to say that Cal might think, look, I've given everything I possibly can? If the tip job was to come up, if Bonner was to vacate it later this year, then maybe it might be the time for Cal to go for a rebuild in his own county as opposed mm. to the same with this Waterford camp. What do you think? Like I, I thought he was going to take the job last year and opened up for him. And I think he showed great you know, trust uh, and belief in, in the players of Waterford when he, made, when he stuck with that position. Um, so I, I don't think he'll take the tip position solely because I think Colin Bonner has to be afforded the respect to get another year like like Murph said there about Brian Lohan and the, and the hand he was dead last year and I agree um, like Colin Bonner needs a bit more time you know he needs definitely another year to try and blood in these players that he's got like he lost a lot of people through retirements lost injuries through the championship that went out and just try to bring in under 20s and under 23 players you could say and take on some of the some of the as we've seen now the best farm teams in the country. So he so first things first, leave Colin Bonner alone, give him another year in the job. I know some tip people mightn't agree with me on that, but I don't give a shit. Like he's only had one year. This is not soccer. Give him a second year, okay? Uh with regards to Liam, Liam Cahill, I'd say he probably looks at the Waterford just globally, looks at them and says, Right, we prepared very well. Our form was so so let's let's give a blip, let's say below to, to against Cork. Our form was so so. So if you prepare well and then you go out in the game and you play to the max of your capacity and you get beaten. You can put your hands up as a manager and player and say, all right, fair enough. You know, we're beaten by a better team. But when you when prepare well and you play shite and much, much, much below the level of what his team is capable of, major questions get asked. And you start just unraveling those questions. Is it, was it him? Was it the management group? Were they, and I, I looked at me yesterday and I said they had no energy, pure lethargic. They were flat. So did they, did they overtrain? Were players coming down? Did they peak too early? There's so many questions that he, only he and his management team and the players collectively can answer. Not, no, not even the board, supporters, us as pundits, we can't answer that. Like, that's for them. So I think for him to make any decision, he has to really dive into that kind of information and see where did they go wrong. And if he believes he can fix it, you know, and get it right next year, I think he'll go back. You know, if he thinks he's given his all and that he's kind of maxed out their potential, maxed out his own potential with this group, you can see him moving on. But like for a man who's obviously steeped in hurling, been involved from tip under age right in his water seniors, what's the next position for him? There's not really one available. Is he going to go to Dublin? No, I don't think so. I can't see that really. That, that doesn't really, it just doesn't fit right. I could be so wrong. We could be here in three, four months time and he could be heading off to Dublin, but it just doesn't fit right. It doesn't feel right to me. Um, like he's not the right type of person or just, they're at different paths in their lives. You know what I mean? Like Cahill is kind of a win now type person and that's what it feels like a water for this year was going to be the culmination of three hard years. It's such a hard one, Will. I, I, right now, if I was betting, I'd say he'll take stock of what happened over this year. He'll try to rejig it a bit and he'll go back again next year. Murph, do you reckon they keep him around? Um, I don't know if it's up to Waterford to keep him around. I think it's Liam Cal's decision whether he's going to stay on or whether he's whether he's going to go. Um, and again, I'd agree with James there in terms of I think he'll do it for the grounds of if he thinks he can go at it next year again, um, and actually correct whatever he feels may have gone wrong when he put the finger on it. He said he was going to talk to the players. I think that'll have a huge influence on them. You know, when he talks to Stephen Bennett's and the Austin Leesons and the Tide the Burkas, I think they'll be very eager for him to stay on. Um, considering what they've what he's done for them over the last few years as well and really put them in a fighting chance of competing for an All Ireland. Um, I think the players feel they probably I could be wrong, but I I, I would feel they think that they owe him something as well, just off this year's performance alone. Um, I don't think again like that. I don't I don't see him going to Dublin. I, I'd agree that I think you know Colin Bonner. In fairness, Colin Bonner doesn't have an easy job stepping in there this year. Like he's the man now trying to blood so many players for Tipperary. Um, you know 
if Liam Cal was to go in there next year, he still has the same job. And I think if anything was going to happen, Liam Cal will decide whether he's sticking with Watford or or he's leaving. If he leaves, I still don't don't think he goes to Tipperary yet. I think he might take stock for a year or two, and then you know Colin Bonner will be afforded his his opportunity, and rightfully so in Tipperary. And I don't see the likes of Liam Cal going for Dublin. Um, like we were saying earlier, that Eddie Brennan is probably a really good fit for Dublin. I think Liam Cal's a really good fit for Tipperary, but maybe just not at the moment. Um, because again, you have to afford Colin Bonner that opportunity. Opportunity. And like James is saying, again, again, another man no more than Brian Owen last year. Another man's going for a little bit of flack asking, is he man for the job? Look, you have to give people time to put their own spin on things. He took over from a manager who, you know, Liam Sheedy, who is obviously big shoes to fill there as well. So there's a lot of moving parts there for me. But I think the main one that Liam Cal will come back to will be he'll sit down with the players. He'll do two things. He'll decide for himself whether he thinks he's capable of going on again. And he'll chat to the players to see, first of all, what answers do they have for him in terms of what happened and can they rectify him for next year. I, I think we'll see another year of Liam Cal and Watford, if I'm honest, if I'm to call it now. Tipperary, oh, so hard to judge for a variety of reasons. So on the pitch this season, they beat a weekend Antrim team. They just about beat Leash in Port Leash. They beat a very experimental Kilkenny team. Lost the rest of their games. Lost to Kerry in pre-season lost all of their championship games now have to wait and see what happens with Kerry about potentially playing them again so results wise if you were to just break it down simply that is a miserable year on the other hand you look at the way they performed at times in the championship against Waterford the way they performed against Limerick for an hour you look at the way that some of these young players who didn't get a huge amount of exposure over the last couple of years have started to fit in you're thinking maybe this actually we're moving in the right direction kind of in spite of the way the results might look but yesterday was so miserable for Tipperary Hurling to be outnumbered by some estimates uh, I think Shane Brophy from the Nina Guardian was saying Cork maybe outnumbered them 5 or 6 to 1 within the ground in Semple Stadium to be hurled off the field in the way that they were to watch Fitzgibbon strolling through their team to score the goal what a miserable day for Tipperary Hurling James um, it will sure, it'll rank down there with probably the worst in their history recent history should I say um, for, for a county who are so proud and that's what they are because they're one of the big three one of the historical three who have always competed like even I'm trying to think over the last 20 years I can't remember I, just, and I could be correct here lad, so if I'm, if I'm wrong tell me I can't remember Tipperary being this poor like do you, like, do you remember over the last 20-20 odd years Tip being this like low down you could say in the pecking order because like, really if we're to do our top 10 right this second you know they're they're down there <laughs> do you know what I mean they they're down there was it a 12 or 13 point hammering from Limerick at one stage but outside of that I can't think of too many times even when Limerick were, or even when Tipperary were going so through a few like kind of mini peaks and troughs over the last 20 years generally this Tipperary team have been very competitive all yeah around. so there's been like say one let's say miscue over the course of the year as opposed to multiple miscues like they've had this year yeah and like the, the writing was on the I don't say the writing was on the wall but it, they, they started as they unfortunately meant to go on and you know, like no disrespect to Kerry, as I said, Kerry beat them. Then they went, they they limped through the league, and then they limped through the championship. And I don't know. I, I see that they got up for the Limerick game, really got up for that, but they just couldn't produce it again. You know, and I think yesterday, I I, I think deep down the team, although they probably projected this kind of go go attitude and let's 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 go after it. I think deep down they knew they weren't going to qualify because the score difference list was they were so far down in the pecking order and they were coming against a team who had pulled off a great result in, in Watford so I think they honestly knew look we're, we're, we're on a hiding to nothing and I do hear it often said about soccer players how they've, they'd be on summer holidays in their heads before the league is even over and it's like it, it got, I got that feeling yesterday I got the feeling that let's say half through the first half when, when Cork turned the tide and you know started to, to create a bit of a bit of separation that's, they just said or you were condemned now at this stage to, to, to a loss. and But I didn't think it's a loss of that of that size. But look, these are bad days for Tip, all right? Uh, the worst thing that people can do in Tipperary, and I've seen a lot on social media about Tipperary supporters giving out about the lack of support that they're offering, right? And that's fair enough. I wasn't at the game. I, I don't know how many people was there. I'm not keeping track of many flipping tip people at the games. But the worst thing you can do now is turn on the team and turn on the manager. So I know Colin Bonner has come into a difficult situation, so he needs support. So if you're a Tip supporter, do exactly that. And that's the same thing with the board. You know, the board have given him a term. He's got two years left in his term, is he? Three year term, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so he's got two years left. So absolutely give me a second year. And if you want to make, as I said, an informed decision after after year two, then take do that. But right now, just back them up, back him, back the players, get in some more youth and, and go from there. Because right now this year is right off. Just fucking forget about it. <laughs> Put it at the back of your head as, as as fast as you can and look towards the future and start 
building now. Yeah, I think uh, Chris Horn was right in his question last week where he asked us about, you know, Central Stadium not being an advantage at home. Uh, we saw Cork go up there and put three goals and 30 points past Tipperary. Uh, to go on the positive side for Cork on this Murph, it's a great response from them. Like mm. the debacle around not having home advantage for the Clare game because of Ed Sheeran, getting hammered on home soil in the first game against Limerick. They looked dead and buried after those first two games. Had to go on the road and win two matches to qualify, did so. Now, the teams faltering around them helped, but Cork have got their mojo back. They have, yeah, and that's exactly it. They have that confidence about them. They have the belief. Like, the first 10 minutes, I was, I was looking at this, and, when, you know, after the Jake Morris goal, I said, they can't do this now. Cork can't turn around and do this after the Waterford match. But really, outside of the first 10 minutes, Cork were just immense in fairness to them. They felt, it, like, it just always felt that they were just completely in control of the match. Okay, that was very obvious then, coming down the home straight, that they were, this was just a formality and they were just getting scores. But once they started, you know, you know, once the Alan Connolly goal went in and things, he kind of went, okay, wait, now, here we go. And this is them kicking off, which is just, look, that's something Cork will just look at have to improve because it was a slow start also against Watford the week before. But outside of those two kind of slow starts... They've, they've, like you said, they've got their mojo back. They're back in the swing of things now. They're looking really confident. They're playing with a type of this Cork kind of cockiness or arrogance that when Cork are going well, that's the way they hurl. Uh, and there's a bit of devilment to the play as well. Like you know, you see lads getting involved, Robbie O'Flynn and things going, getting involved in lads and mixing it up with boys and hitting lads a few shoulders. And you know, the likes of that is when teams are going well, that's what you'll see. You'll see lads standing up to lads and kind of you know stamping your ground and marking your ground and different things. So Cork are doing that at the moment, and it's it's just you know it's remarkable to see it. Like you said, it just seemed like they were heading in one direction in the early rounds at round robin. After the defeats, you're just going, this is only one thing for them. So in fairness to them, look, we've been hard on them here, and I think justifiably in many times. Times, but they've earned their place they're back into the swing of things now um, and again no more than I was saying about Wexford uh, going through the qualifiers like who, who wants to meet Cork now coming through the qualifiers nobody wants to meet them at the moment because if they keep this up and keep that form and that's the thing keep it going and I, talk, I talked about momentum with Clare going into once final Cork need to keep this momentum now because there's no more room for you know losing matches there's no more room for finding your feet or what are we doing you're, like we're into the stages now of the All Ireland series where it's just a case of throw everything at every single game and hope you keep that momentum headed in the one direction that you're going towards an All Ireland final. Because Cork, if they get their back up, they'll cause problems for any team, and I include Limerick in that. They still have a little bit further to go, but they've shown over the last few years that they can beat Limerick. So if they get back to the good place that we know that they're capable of being in, and we see the likes of Shane Kingston motoring well and, and, and Tim O'Mahony coming on, and they seem to find this new role for Tim O'Mahony as well. Well, Cork could do a lot of damage in, in this series as well. So, um, look, yeah, they, have, they got their mojo back. They're in a good place. And I think the, the, the championship is a better place for having Cork hurling like this. Yeah, look, they're free scoring. Even with Horgan in the last couple of games, maybe not having his best matches. And again, he was withdrawn during the game against Tipperary. But they still finish up with 3.30. Uh, Lahan scale obviously takes a lot of the headlines because of the way he played. And when space was afforded, he was popping scores over for fun in that game on Sunday afternoon. I, I guess bringing him back in has been vindicated as a very good decision now because last year he was watching on uh, while yeah. his Cork teammates were going to an All Ireland final. But he's added something back into that panel since coming back in. Well, I think if you look at his whole career, the whole Cork career, this is probably Barry's his first actual year where he's introduced as a, as a kid in 2012. This is his be probably his best year for Cork. I think it's fair to say where he's produced the most consistency because, like historically, he would have been a guy who'd been up down the good one day. Not so good this following day and so on. So, but he's he's produced a level of consistency that Cork needed. They need, should I say, um, definitely in the last couple of weeks. Uh, whereby he's he sh he's shooting the lights out. Fair enough, yeah. But we noticed back in the in the we talked about the the league game when they played Limerick. And we said that like he was actually you know, going up contesting ball, putting in sort of the hard yards that 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 you'd associate with you know, like the banners of the matters of this world. Whereby he was getting in and tackles and he was getting up high, high for balls or contesting stuff that would be 50-50 base that he normally wouldn't do because he was normally a free space hurler open space hurler get onto a ball and do damage so he's changed his game a bit I think he's modified himself um, to to become more of a, a nitty gritty hard hurler but then he also has the finesse to, to score flipping was it 8 points yesterday 7 from play so like he's he's on he's on good form and again I keep I, I've mentioned this about, about, about uh, Westwood should I say about their forwards if Corker to progress you know they know that Hoggy will score the, fine, the points they say from the freeze etc but they need Harnley and they need Lehan and they need Robbie Flynn throwing himself around the place so they need these lads so, so I know we're, we're, we're praising Lehan and rightfully so he's doing really good he's to back it up the next day 
back up the day after and keep producing if Cork are going to go forward. Because like when you play okay, when you play clear, you know Donald and Kelly and these boys and Doug are going to are going to perform. You play Limerick, you know Lynch is going to play Hegarty, Glenn, they're all going to perform to, to a serious high level. When you know when Cork are playing, I just don't know. Do you mean? And when they do perform, geez, they're class. You know, they're, they're, they're class. And I love watching them. Because when, they, when their tails are up, geez, they're fierce hard to stop. But it's just, if, if for them to get their tails up, you just don't know. And like, even the, they go the next day, now they're probably, who are they playing to say, Will? They'll play the winners of the Joe McDonough Cup final away from home. So I'm, I'm putting my hat on here and I'm going to say they're playing Antrim. Open Antrim. Yeah. yeah, so long spin for them to go, they have to go up and take care of business up there. And like, Antrim will love that. You know, they'll love Cork coming up, let's say, if they obviously come to Kerry. They love that, so that that's a test. I know they might look, it might look. I know the bookmakers might have it as a test, but that's a flipping test. Cork have to come through and get on with it, and then after that, then they're playing the Leinster. Those the Leinster runs up, so that's going to be a tough test for everyone. Um, interesting to see, like watch this space when it comes to Cork. Um, they're they're gaining they're they're gaining a bit of momentum, as Paul keeps saying, and I agree with him. And uh, momentum can take you a long way in sport, but not all the way. Yeah, just to give you the results then from the Joe Maitona Cup uh, round on Saturday. Uh, Kerry beating Antrim just about in the end to qualify for the final. 29 points to two goals and 21. Uh, Carlo ending Offaly's chances of reaching the decider, beating Offaly by 22 points to 17. So Carlo finished in third place on scoring difference. Offaly in fourth place. Uh, down and Meath right down at the bottom of the table in the relegation zone. At the last game in Ballycran, it was down two goals and 28. It was Meath two goals and 19. So it's been a disappointing year for Meath, relegated from uh, Division 2A of the National Hurling League as well Christy Ring Cup final no surprise to be had in the decider in the end uh, Kildare who've been in tremendous form since their nice players came back from the club championship they managed to beat Mayo by 2 goals and 29 points to 19 points at Crow Park I just throwing this out there right now I think Kildare could be competitors next year in the Joe McDonough if they go up and hurl the way they did in the Christy Ring this could be bringing that momentum up along with them in the Nicky Rackard Cup final it was a victory for Tyrone against Roscommon one goal in 27 points to 19 points so Tyrone go up to the John McDonough for next year in the Laurie Mara Cup final it was Loud three goals and 27 points Longford three goals and 14 so um, really exciting afternoon of hurling at Crow Park and there the ups and downs uh, so far in that competition lads I was delighted uh, last Monday the throw in was put back uh, for the game between Offaly and Leash in the Leinster Minor hurling final because I was late enough getting into it after we went over on the pod last week um, but thankfully there was crowd congestion everywhere and there was a 15 minute delay to throw in Offaly won in the end 21 points to 13 against Leash their first title since 2000 at the grade and remarkably Paul this was like a high school football game uh, officially I think they clocked about 13,000 people going through the gate but because of the under 16s going through for free it felt like there was a lot more than that the stand was very full and the terraces looked full all the way around too um, sometimes maybe if derbies are marketed on the right night of the week and if there's an interest level and the counties are bringing like I think Offaly brought a thousand young kids in buses across right. to the game and uh, you know, Leash County Board made sure a huge crowd from coming to Munskull went along so it was full of excited kids they're all out in the pitch at half time it's amazing what a kind of little festival of hurling can be made if the scheduling is right and everyone gets in behind it yeah absolutely and and it was really the story early on last week and we were all seeing the pictures on social media of uh, like again we reported one stage 12,000 another stage was 14,000 another stage was 13 but either way that's remarkable for a standalone for a standalone game for a minor game underage I mean that's brilliant and it must have been a really special moment for those lads as well that they knew that they were the only show in town they weren't here for you know they, they were warming up for a senior match or anything like that they were the only show in town and it's just it, it, like that's again a, a match that will live on in their memory for a long time and even for the leash players you'd like to think that they were part of a really special match there again great great idea all these buses of juveniles come and, and bring them into the match and like you said it creates a carnival type of atmosphere and those players as well who probably haven't had a huge amount to look at over the last few years in terms of Leash and Offaly going for individually going for to win a cup there was a cup there the other day up for grabs all these juvenile underage players that arrived in the buses got to see Leash minors Offaly minors compete for this you know it's something to aspire to for those players so and I saw Michael Dignan talking about it as well earlier in the week that it was brilliant to see it as well so I just think like it was just such a feel good factor about it um, unfortunately like I said there can only be one winner and Offaly obviously ran out um, winners in the end um, but when you, when you, if someone showed you a picture of the game before and g- didn't give you the context, you'd swear it was an inter-county game. Um, and even look, Leach and Offaly, if they were to go senior, you know, um, a senior match, would they have drawn that crowd at the moment? 
you know, absolutely probably not. absolutely not. Oh, to be fair, to you, no. <laughs> I'm Murphy. You're, you're going to say probably not. Yeah, <laughs> probably not. Do you know, <laughs> my notion. It's it's not. But look, it's not to batter. It's not to be hard on the leash lads or the off yeah. senior. But again, so I, I just think fair play to him. Um, there are credits the credits to the young lads. Like we were talking about the week before again, um, Claire and Tipperary in, in the other minor final and how much of a great game it was and how tough it was for those lads going and, and, and a penalty shootout. So look, it's absolutely brilliant for Offaly and Offaly and Leash and like you said carnival atmosphere just incredible uh, scenes for, for the match it was brilliant yeah uh, also remarkably look with my head of hair I can't uh, be criticising any young lads for the haircuts they're going out with but <laughs> two Leinster finals now in a row Tullamore players have won man of the match with a mullet yeah. uh, last year it was Cormac Egan uh, this year it was Killian Martin <laughs> Kevin Martin's young lad who had the most remarkable of uh, mullets with a curly mullet effect uh, which you'll see on the YouTube because I'll throw up a picture on it I was half joking with Cormac Egan after the game and I said to him that uh, the barbers in Tullamore are now going to be asked to either do an Egan or a Martin for the rest of the summer because uh, all these young lads will be looking up to them so uh, some remarkable haircuts there and again it just goes to show the way that sometimes uh, stock works its way down if we talk about breeding of players with uh, Killian there uh, Kevin's young lad getting man the match in the middle of the field and then there was young Furlong up front again a bit like John Furlong who was uh, won the forwards for the Offaly under 20s last year uh, their granddad uh, Martin Furlong would have been the goalkeeper who saved the penalty in the 1982 All-Ireland final it was part of three All-Ireland winning uh, football teams so Offaly are still making the most of the good stock that they have gone through a remarkable night very enjoyable indeed both teams still alive in the championship Offaly go directly to an All-Ireland semi-final mm -hmm. and we've got the first round of games played uh, last weekend yeah. Scal Galway had a really good win against Clare to kick off yeah. their campaign yeah a really good win like um like I suppose in fairness to Clare that was Clare's fifth game so there's, there's kind of two, two arguments there you can say A are they coming in primed battle hardened or B are they coming in tired and they are probably a small bit they looked a bit tired but our guys were fresh um, they are well up for it produced a, a mass performance you've got a, you've got a couple of young guys in the likes of Aaron Island like he's 16 he's Evan's younger brother and he's he's the real deal that's the, the, talk is, the talk is he might even turn out to be better than his brother is that fair? Um, pressure early on I look I, I'm going to say it straight out yes it is fair like he, like if, he, if he keeps going like on the graph he's at the minute he's going to be better than Evan like Evan's class there's no ways about it but I'm, I'm putting Aaron not to put too much pressure on the kid like, like, but like he, he has the potential and that's the key word potential and only if it's nurtured to be, to be very 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 good you know like I was going to make a comparison there but I, I'd be shot if I did like he's <laughs> oh, he's, no. he's as good of a minor as another lad would, we know you know what I mean Oh, Canning, Canning can't get away. Like he's the ghost of this podcast. Every week he, he gets a mention in some way. I'll get him on here now. I get him on here. Yeah, we will get him on. Hit him with a few questions. But yeah. I know. Look, Joe was exceptional as a minor. That's, uh, to be honest, with you, he was exceptional as a minor. Probably the outlier in terms of quality over the whole minor grade of honesty. But like Aaron, like is has the, again the potential. We have to remember the kid's sixteen, so he's not eighteen like 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 Joe was, and we all were. Do you know? So he's got another couple of years for of of S and C of just you know learn learn the basics of tactics etc so he needs to be for that opportunity so I'm not to heap too much pressure on him but like he's he's shit hot <laughs> so, that, yeah. so they're playing Leash now again this weekend at 12 in Port Leash so that'll be I'm not sure we get 13,000 there now are we? No I don't, not quite uh, but I think the Leash fans will still travel uh, with expectation that they might reach an All-Ireland semi-final yet and yeah, then Leash, uh, they, Leash finished off their campaign away to Clare I think on the weekend of the bank holiday I definitely saw yeah. a provincial fix, a provisional fixture I should say coming out for that so uh, Leash now get their campaign back underway home against Galway away to Clare uh, top two teams in that group will qualify for the next round and Tip and Offaly are on either side of the semi-final draw afterwards I, look I like the structure of this championship we can argue all they want about the, uh, the penalties and whether they should have happened or not happened I like the teams get lots of games because it's a group game in the provincials Galway are assured of at least the two fixtures because of this round robin and we still get interest in semi-finals afterwards as well that, that is going to be exciting times and that mm -hmm. just reminds me as well you know we were talking about um, lads coming through and pressure and whatever I don't know if either you saw that Dan Ravenhill who was the number 11 on the Offaly team is a neighbour of Michael Dignan's and about three or four years ago he stuck a picture of him playing yeah. the goal games the mini schools yeah and said this lad will go on and play senior for Offaly 
well now at 16 years of age he's already playing inter-county minor so intriguing to see if in the next four or five years he can follow his brother in playing senior hurling it would be quite some call out of Michael Dyken I think in it was maybe in 2016 or 2017 when he made the call if he goes on to be a senior player so that's us for this week lads uh, thanks a million to you for listening to us um, you might check us out on the hurling pod feed on uh, off the ball if you can subscribe there that's the best way to get it first it'll be up by around about 7 o'clock each Monday evening and then each Tuesday we threw a poll up last week on the YouTube some lads were saying jeez lads this show is on very late when it went after 12 o'clock because of the uh, two hour recording time we'll try and keep it a little bit under two hours each week but we're going to stream around 10 o'clock uh, each Tuesday but your feedback is always wanted on this I think it was nearly 100 likes and 30 odd comments last week on the YouTube so uh, we love hearing from you guys and your opinions and we'll stick questions to the lads next week especially when we've a little bit of a break before the provincial finals James, Paul thanks a million as always Sounds.